Yeah, we are recording now. This is meeting number 26 of the Visual Tools group, the Closure of Visual Tools group, which is, which is you know, usually about UI and, and uh, UI design and data visualization. But this time it is special because we have two special speakers speaking about internet protocols in different contexts and the way they can, use, they can be used from Closure. And many thanks to Daniel and Gary who agreed to talk today. So here we are, Nikita and Tim and Daniel and Daniel and Gary. And we'll begin by introducing ourselves and then we'll have the two presentations and some discussion. Uh, so maybe, Tim, would you like to say something about yourself? Sure, uh, I'm Tim Schaefer, uh, Closure lover, JVM enjoyer and JavaScript acceptor. Uh, <laughs> I mostly make uh, web apps, or at least that's what I've done in the past. Um, and uh, I'm just looking to do more stuff with data and uh, um, functional programming. And that's where I have come to closure. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'm Daniel. I do uh, statistics and probability usually. and, and uh, you know, some community organizing. And I don't know much about internet protocols. I've been learning a lot in the past from Daniel, who is uh, one of our speakers here today. So I am looking to learn more today. Um, and Nikita, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm Nikita Dudnik. Uh, well, like I'm front-end developer, mostly, uh, mostly web, a little bit of mobile and native. So different la languages, but they work is JavaScript TypeScript, which isn't uh, <laughs> like my most favorite choice of tools, but managers and CTOs love it these days. So yeah, like, uh, yeah, when I can, I use uh, Clojure Script and Clojure, uh, most, my most favorite languages for sure. I think the other one favorite is Rust, but I'm still learning it and it's very different beast. So yeah, you know, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. Ah, and regarding G Gemini, I actually know about it. I find it really interesting tech because actually it's like both protocol user interface and user experience like in one package, which makes it pretty interesting to me as like somebody who's into like human computer interaction in general. So yeah, uh, that's it about me and my interest. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful, thank you so much. And hello, Chuck. Hello, Chuck. Thank you for joining us. If you wish, we are just kind of introducing ourselves. So you're also invited to say something after you settle in. And, and uh, Daniel, would you like to say something? Hi, um, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here and uh, talk to your group. Um, I'm Daniel, I'm doing Clojure, um, both um, as a entrepreneur and as a uh, uh, when I work for companies where or when I consult or or, or uh, so the the thing that I want to share basically uh, if you want to I don't really have something to sell I don't have anything to sell basically but what I do have what I can what I can uh, share. And maybe pick your interest is um, Maven dot uh, org. Uh, Maven, it's a wrap. Uh, it's a um, it's a build tool for Clojure, uh, which um, is both uh, a replacement or, or does the, the same job as Lining Gun and uh, or uh, uh, Tools Devs. Although Maven also uses uh, Tools Devs, uh, it's a wrapper. It's a wrapper around Maven, around the Java uh, build tool Maven. And the reason uh, I'm busy with, with Maven for many years now is that uh, I, I just stumbled across an architecture for a build tool which, uh, which I think should have been the standard for the, for the Clojure community, uh, which is, okay, it sounds whatever it sounds to you, but it's... Um, the same way that Clojure is built on on the JVM, uh, if you take this, the reason why the motivation for why Clojure or why Rich had made the, the decision to to uh, to make a, a um, this symbiosis with the JVM 
Well, the same logic applies to, to the build uh, capabilities and we should have built uh, the, the build tools on on Maven, which which is the, at least, uh, which is a huge, maybe the, the most important build tool for Java. And why? For the same reason, so that it gives you access to the uh, giant ecosystems of plugins and um, which plugins are just pro. I mean, it's just it's the ecosystem, the ecosystem which allows you to do everything from building Docker files to deploying to Graal VM or, or compiling it to Graal VM or um, even assembling the jar, uh, uh, deploying it on servers. Uh, you just you just think of anything. Uh, Maven has a plugin for it, and. This has played out very well for me. Uh, the thing is that because because it's a build tool uh, and and it could be useful for a lot of people, I'm extremely wary of uh, making it public because there are so many um, every everybody there's first of all, there's a lot of requirements for for a build tool, and you can't please everyone, especially. So basically, I'm doing it in my own corner, but I'm making it available. Um, and I'm building uh, more and more capabilities on top. There is now a UI, and there is a uh, a way to to start to jumpstart projects in Clojure with templates. But it's using the the Maven industrial strength template uh, templating solution. So you have a lot of benefits uh, for that as well. Um, but it's. I can't, you know, I can't invite everyone. I can't uh, push it open source um, as an open source project. Uh, contrary to other stuff that I that I have open source, I have open source many stuff in the past, but th these are small libraries and they are focused and they, and you can just finish it and that's it. With Maven, uh, I don't know when I will reach a point where I will be able to say, okay, guys, try it out. Um, but I am I'm, I am talking about this now because if if you do uh, want to to check it out, and uh, you, you are more more than welcome, and you're more than welcome also to to talk to me. Uh, I'm I'm easy to find. Uh, the 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 website is called maven.org. Uh, Maven is spelled um, M E Y V N. It means um, somebody who understands in Yiddish. It's a wordplay on Maven, the build tool for Java, and Maven, a word in Yiddish, which means understanding. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the subtitle of the tool is Know Your Build, because this is what it's all, all about. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my uh, my my intro. Thank you for, for the opportunity. Thank you so much. And yeah, I did share the link at the chat. And... And yeah, and maybe Gary, would you like to tell more about yourself now? And, and then we'll ask Chuck if Chuck wishes to say anything, and then we'll begin with the talks. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that for sure. Um, so I wonder actually if my screen will share with this platform. Let's let's find out here. Hopefully. Is my screen coming through? Yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, so hi, my name is Gary Johnson. Um, I've been working with Clojure since 2008 when I first came across it uh, in my PhD work at the University of Vermont. Um, I was, uh, my, my research background is in environmental modeling, so uh, simulation modeling, satellite imagery processing, um, scenario analysis, and so on and so forth. So I get to do high performance computing, web app development. Um, model development and data science with Clojure. And I've been doing that, as I said, since 2008. Uh, so for the past 16 years, um, I work for a company called Spatial Informatics Group here on this, on the, uh, should be showing uh, on your screen right now. So we're an environmental think tank, as we say, we do lots of things. We work, <laughs> we work in environmental mapping, ecosystem services, forest agriculture management, forest carbon offsets, natural hazards risk assessment, and so on and so forth. So I get to do this kind of stuff. Um, I am a big functional programming advocate. And so when I first came to work for this company, uh, I was the only software engineer because everybody at my company was a had a graduate degree in some natural resource management field, like 
carbon science, forest ecology, hydrology, fire science, something like that. And I was, I was the computer scientist. And I came here um, to work at this company because I'm really passionate about uh, environmental problem solving. Uh, and I think that the engineering and data science mindset has a ton to bring to the table in the environmental field. And I think it's an area that's underserved by computer programmers. Um, so that's why I got into it a few decades ago. And so when I got here, I started building all my, my new tools with Clojure. And at the time, there were good libraries and tools for these things, and some of things were missing, and I had to build them myself over time. And, I, and I've now built up a team. We have a team of about 20 uh, people on my software team now, all Clojure developers, uh, working here at SIG, writing environmental science uh, solutions in various ways. And uh, I have, this is, this is me, where I live in the forest of Vermont. I live off grid. Uh, in the northeastern United States, out in the mountains, uh, surrounded by trees. <laughs> in a, as I was telling folks on the call before we started recording, uh, there's no cell service or phone lines or power lines or anything out on my property, so I'm communicating via satellite internet here. Uh, this is where I live. This is my yurt, uh, my outbuildings and whatnot, and then I own uh, about 70 acres of forest around this. I, I replaced the roof last year, so it's actually a nice big metal roof now, but this is how it looked uh, a year or so ago. Yeah, so there's me chopping firewood. So <clears throat> motivation for the talk today, we're going to talk about some simple protocols and really getting down into building things by hand. I'm a big fan of working with hand tools. Um, I process all the firewood that heats my house and cooks my food and heats my hot water and everything else uh, from my forest using good old fashioned hand tools, cross cut saws and axes and so on and so forth. Um, I scythe my field. I, I do a lot of land management with hand tools because um, I like just knowing how the small things work. And so a lot of my motivation for working with uh, things like Gemini uh, are both my interest in environmental computing, which includes uh, low power computing and um, the kinds of software that can run on old computers that can be refurbished and kept around for longer before they have to go and become e-waste. Um, simple tech that we can break apart part and understand ourselves uh, and therefore have more control over and become and can be more resilient and less dependent upon uh, third parties or large corporations to provide our tech to us. Um, and uh, ultimately, I'm, I'm just a geek. So I enjoy learning how to build things even if they've been built before, uh, just because I want to know how they work. Um, yeah, that's me building my, my house, <laughs> which is a, an actual stone cellar uh, with a yurt on top of it and so on and so forth. And, uh, and that's, that's where I live. So that's me. I'll be excited to talk to you guys today a little bit about the Gemini protocol and uh, related tech. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe Chuck, uh, if you wish, if your mind uh, is good, uh, would you like to say something about this? Uh, we'll try to that. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, and then, yeah, and then you disappear. Oh, yeah. Anyway, Chuck, if you wish to write something on the chat so that people will know you because not everybody has met you, that would be lovely. And thank you so much. Oh, oh can you try to say something now? I'll try. I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, no, um, yeah. We see you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was going to say my background, maybe not so much my background, but like my motivations and stuff for, for, being interested in coming here, similar, very similar to Gary's. Um, I, my, my interest in closure and work with closure is more just from a hobbyist perspective, but um, my background professionally has been more on the IT infrastructure and building systems, design systems. Um, you know, right now I'm working in a platform architecture role for an automotive startup, you know, helping build out the infrastructure that eventually all of the manufacturing and plant and all that stuff will, will run on and but just for the websites and custom maps are developed. But like my day to day, I don't get to do a lot of closure development, but I'm interested in building tools and stuff. Um, I recently went back to school, uh, finishing a degree and, you know, did a lot of work with um, a lab there, do, you know, agro science lab there helping do some data science work and build some tools there. And I really like enjoy that kind of work, like helping helping people in other domains build tools with technology that, you know, help them get their jobs done and, and that sort of thing. Um, I do have quite a bit of experience with network 
protocols and stuff, not so much with Gemini in particular, although I'm kind of familiar with the idea, but not the, the low level or the actual implementation of it. Um, and I've also like taken a stab at doing some network visualization tools at Clojure in, in the past that I sort of forgot about and was reminded by when this thing came up. And so I was interested to see what was going on. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm here. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you everybody for taking the time and telling something about yourself. That's that's actually helpful because the people who couldn't make it today will later listen and get to know you. And yeah, that means something, I think. Great. So I guess we'll begin now with the presentations. And uh, would you like to begin, Daniel? Uh, and we have a lot of time. We have like one hour till the official time. And and then uh, some people may wish to say stay longer, but please take the time. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm gonna talk very shortly um, um, because basically um, the the origin the original idea for this meeting uh, or, or, or it was spurred by by the by a conversation I had with Daniel Sutsky um, over my blog post and 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 so I think. For me, the main the main message, my main message, is just check out check out the blog post. Um, the what what blog post? Well, it's 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 a playful kind of exploration of uh, the HTTP protocol, and I myself started writing it after I saw um, computer file uh, computer file episode on YouTube. Computer file who, for people who don't know is a YouTube channel. Uh, by a British uh, computer scientist. It's pretty well done. They have a very approachable um, format, but they they delve uh, deep uh, in in um, in computer science topics. And there was um, one one episode was uh, how to write a web server in a couple of uh, lines of code. Which is always it, it, this kind of topics, or this kind of titles uh, or ideas have always a high impact because people no, normally don't write web servers and they don't have any idea of how many lines it takes to write a web server. But um, and certainly the pro, the commercial uh, web servers, uh, commercial products, they uh, they they are big projects and they have a lot of lines of code. So when 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 somebody tells you, "Oh, I can I can write a web survey in five in five lines," then then it's like, "Oh, really? Wow! How do you how do you do that?" But actually, uh, everything everything is is, uh, is 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 depends on how you define a web server and what exactly does it do and 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 stuff like that. But if you do take the minimalist approach of uh, doing a request over the HTTP protocol, uh, then then of course you can write something in very little lines of code. Um, you can actually write a one-liner uh, with uh, Netcat. Uh, but uh, what the computer file uh, episode was about it was a uh, the traditional. Uh, TCP socket uh, written in opening a TCP socket in, with Rust and then uh, re, uh, listening for requests and then uh, serving those requests. Um, and what he demonstrated was something which can serve a static website. And uh, it's an episode of 20 minutes. It's very enjoyable to watch if, if you want to start by watching that before the blog then that might be a good idea as well. Um, the, the only thing is that the, the actual code that he wrote is mixing um, the transport, the TCP socket handling, and, and the serving of the request in HTTP uh, protocol. So you have basically something that is very coupled. You have both the... Uh, the TCP transport and the HTTP protocol and the application, everything is coupled together. Um, because it's so short and it's an exercise and it doesn't need to be anything fancy. But when I started, uh, I wanted just to play around, to fool around at the REPL. I just started to see how, how would you do this uh, in Clojure. And of course, 
you, you reach out for the Java socket API. And then you can write this very quickly, what he's doing, but it's still coupled. So when I was looking uh, to untangle that and separate the, 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 the transport uh, from uh, and the, the HTTP protocol from the application, I just uh, recreated a route or an itinerary uh, that all programming languages uh, have done, which is abstracting application code from HTTP protocol. And in other languages, uh, it's called, uh, in Ruby, it's called RAC. In Python, it's called the WSGI. And Java does it with servlets and, and all these things. So every every time, uh, every programming language has has implemented the same, the same ideas uh, around abstracting application code from HTTP uh, protocol. And that in closure, we call this ring. Ring is the abstraction that we use. And uh, the blog post uh, basically recreates ring, uh, shows how and why you, you do everything that ring is doing, uh, which is the reason is make, making sure that developers can write applications without having to resort to um, to the lower level foundations um, and just write application code and not HTTP code or not TCP code, God forbid, <laughs> because nobody, nobody wants to do that. Um, so this abstraction is found across multiple uh, programming languages and it's very similar. Uh, and the first analogy I want to make is that um, the the same cross cross um, cross compatibility you find with the socket API, which is uh, what enables TCP uh, TCP IP applications in the first place. So things like uh, web servers and stuff like that. Uh, this is just a note. Uh, so basically, my my talk is there is no talk. I'm I'm just saying go and and read the blog post. But I have make I have written a, a bit a couple of notes, and what I'm going to do now for a couple of minutes, and then I I'm going to leave the stage for something much more interesting, uh, Gary. But for now, I'm just going to to make a couple of notes, a couple of things that I want to share. Um, so so the 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 same yeah. So the first thing I want to share is the analogy between the fact that every programming language has resorted to the same abstraction um, for for separating, decoupling the HTTP and uh, application code, and everybody calls it something something else. Uh, this is very similar, what I found, to the socket API, the, the Berkeley socket, which is a very old abstraction to, to abstract over the inter-process communications via the internet the, it's uh the big berkeley sockets have have emerged uh it's an old technology uh i mean it's 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 what what enabled um programming in the internet basically um and abstracting away the protocols of the internet the, what we call the internet protocols the internet protocols are tcp udp ip uh a, a, a host a host of of protocols which uh which we can we loosely call uh, the internet so the 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 berkeley socket uh um is an abstraction which is incredibly successful it's like so successful that we don't think about it but it's found uh across some languages which what really blows my mind is that the api of the sockets AP, of the socket the, the sockets in all languages is the same more or less so it comprises of a couple of call that, uh, calls that you will recognize if you have done Sockets API. If you have not done Sockets API, this is why I recommend you to play around with uh, you know, uh, what I've done with you know, recreating uh, uh, the... In my exercise, in my blog post, I talk about how you know, I write a, um, a simple uh, web application uh, and I use the the sockets API in Java, but what I want, but, and and so so anyone who has uh, written uh, applications and manipulating sockets, 
uh, knows uh, the 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 calls uh, the API, which is connect and open and bind and send and a couple of verbs like this, uh, which is found really everywhere in all languages. Uh, I mean, in many languages, C, C sharp, uh, uh, what do you call it, C sharp, C++, uh, Java, um, and, and, and uh, so that, that is one, one thing, that the, the success of the Berkeley Sockets uh, abstraction, the Berkeley Sockets API. Uh, it's actually um, it's very well built, and it's actually more. It's even it, nowadays it's used only for in, I mean, or mostly for internet applications. But actually, the Berkeley sockets. What what is it? It's a uh, it's a, it was devised to be an abstraction over inter-process communication, and internet is just one one set of protocols. But it's it's really. Uh, a very, very uh, large surface abstraction. And it's a Unix thing also. That's the other thing that is interesting. It's um, implemented with the Unix philosophy that everything is a file. So basically the idea of Berkeley sockets is you, you want to do inter-process communication, great. Here is the... the uh, the API, you, you, you create a socket, and then you have a, a thing that you can uh, treat as a file. That's exactly, uh, everything, everything is a file uh, kind of uh, logic or philosophy of Unix. And uh, it, it is like a file descriptor. You can read, read, read from it and write to it and then close to it, close it and stuff like that. So that's the idea. Okay. So that's why we have sockets. That's why we have sockets. I mean, it's 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 well done and it's it's uh, it has uh, it has completely taken over uh, the uh, and it can be found everywhere and and uh, and uh, and this is um, so that's that's the first note I want to do. I, I find it interesting to to compare or, or to know the fact that. Successful abstractions, they have a long life. Uh, uh, socket, Sockets API is still with us. It became the POSIX now. It's called also, so they are called Berkeley Sockets, but they are the same as, uh, they also go by the name of POSIX and they go by the name of uh, B BSD uh, Sockets. And they are they are very old. I, I didn't check when, but it's uh, more than 30 years at least. Uh, but uh, somebody, uh, you can go and check it out. How long? How, long, how much longer? I don't know. But uh, same thing with the um, the ring API. The ring API, the ring protocol is uh, an abstraction. The ring abstraction is again, it's very successful, but it's it goes by a different name in all languages. So, but it's basically the same as RAC or WS, WSGI. It's the same. The same kind of principle have been applied for this. So this is interesting that. Successful, a good abstraction has a long life, which is very interesting to also correlate with protocols. A good protocol also has a very long life. And, and now I just want to talk a little bit about protocols. Uh, we can we can say, I mean, uh, I mean, the internet today, we, we are living in the age of the internet and the, and the age of the internet was made possible by these public protocols uh, that were made available that serve as a foundation for for the whole for everyone to build upon and that's why we have we have an internet now there is a an incredible irony that this this beautiful internet which is really beautiful in terms of social it's a social it's not it's not only a technolo technology technology uh, uh, technological uh, invention it's also a social invention there were always very strong social motivations behind uh, the idea of the internet, social engineering. All people really remember the, the all the, yeah, I don't know who was, uh, has anyone read the Wired uh, magazine at the time uh, in, the, in the 80s and the 90s? That it was really about the internet when, when the internet was not a thing. And uh, it was very exciting, and it was uh, oh, we can now talk freely. We have freedom of expression. We have, we will have um, 
we will not need this, the government so much. We will be able to to do, you know dem democratic uh, sovereignty, uh, sovereignty of the people, all all kinds of uh, lofty ideas, really. And um, and then we what what we have today is something uh, very very different. We have big corporations um, that um, that make that have benefited from the internet and given us services and products that we use daily but that uh that are centralized right so they they centra they what they do is that they have they capture our data and they do whatever they do with it right they do uh, many a lot of money uh by you know selling data analyzing data uh exchanging data with other companies blah 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 and uh of course uh there is a tremendous, first of all, disappointment by the generation who witnessed the birth of the internet, but also there is a desire to go back to uh, to these or to fight back, basically to fight back because the 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 term the term that is used today for and I'm talking about an academic term and I hope it will make you laugh if you have never heard about it because it's called enchitification. And enchitification, it's it sounds very, I mean, it is a hilarious uh, term, but it's uh, it's very serious. It's a uh, it's an academic term. It's a social. It's a uh, it's a uh, it really describes uh, the cycle of um, technologies in the or companies or services in the internet age today. What is it? Uh, it's it's the process of degradation of a service over time. Um, and and the, why why does it happen? It happens because and think about Facebook, think about Google, think about these companies. Which Google is very I mean Facebook everybody knows how shitty it's people don't realize how how shitty Google is. Uh, you can uh, Google search today is broken. It's it's a disaster. Um, but uh, never mind. We uh, people will realize how how shitty uh, every, uh, Google is uh, sooner or later. But um, uh, everybody knows for Facebook, right? I mean, I mean, I don't know if anybody <laughs> takes Facebook seriously. But it's still it's still a thing. Now, what is enchitification? It's the same process that happens with all these companies. First, they serve their users, everybody, uh, and people are happy. Um, Slowly, with time, they realize that their bottom line is important, so they start favoring the business users. So you have uh, happy business users, and you have slowly realizing users that you know that that they don't get the same service as before, and it takes time. And you know, in the beginning, uh, the companies they they have ways to explain everything away, so they they say, uh, "No, it's good for everyone." Little by little, uh, business users are prioritized, and then the, at the later stage, it's the shareholders who are being prioritized. So they they just disregard all users, and at that time, they just serve the shareholders, and all decisions are uh, guided by um, by the priorities of the or the interests of the shareholders. And it makes sense that it happens because we live in a capitalist uh, uh, economy, and this is how capital capitalism works. So there is no nothing to to uh, to to be uh, surprised about. But what is interesting is that um, the fight the, the people who want to fight back are saying, "Listen, we need to go back to protocols. We need to use those. We we know the power of a good public protocol. It's a foundation that the whole world can adopt, and it doesn't belong to anyone. Like TCP doesn't belong to any company. IP is not so." We need to to de to to, uh, to 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 promote protocols uh, to gain our internet back, and the most textbook example lately uh, I know of uh, in the recent age is the efforts to regain the, the 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 public forum that was Twitter that once was Twitter before the takeover by uh, uh, by Musk and the the idea of uh, recreating a Twitter which will not be centralized, which will not go entitification because it will not belong to any one entity. 
so a decentralized Twitter, a decentralized social uh, social media, and and the way that uh, everybody agreed to do that was to design a open public protocol. And uh, this, this has given us the blue sky uh, uh, protocol. I think it's called AT protocol. It doesn't matter really, but it's uh, what we know as blue sky or blue sky is an implementation of the AT protocol, which is a sophisticated uh, protocol, completely open. Everybody can, can chime in. I think uh, it's not even final, I don't know, but uh, it's, a interesting, uh, it's an interesting protocol. And the jury is still out there if it's successful or not, because it's too early to tell. Uh, what I can say uh, personally is that uh, I think uh, the protocol is really well designed. It's a very interesting protocol. It's very nice for developers. I did a couple of things on top of it. Uh, I highly recommend it. But I do have to admit also that I don't use Blue Sky so much. Uh, I don't see people using it so much. I don't know if Blue, Sky, if Blue Sky is already, if it's too early to to call it a a, a failure, or if these things take time and you know and 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 it's still uh, it's still still too too early. But besides the Blue Sky uh, prot or AT and the Blue Sky, there are a host of new uh, protocols and a lot of them and, and social efforts and com small communities who are doing things. And, and uh, there's a, a lot happening. And they're all with the same idea that protocols, an open protocol can, can, can be the salvation for, for the centralized uh, shitty, shitty internet. And now finally, I can uh, cede my uh, the stage to to Gary because that we we reached the point where uh, I think uh, Gary will will talk about uh, one such protocol that he's uh, been uh, busy with, which is exactly I think uh, this is my perception that uh, exemplifies this desire for a uh, a non corporate internet uh, and. Back to basics and uh, simple and uh, and and open and democratic. So, uh, Gemini. But I, Gary, Gary will will be able to tell you much more than me. So, uh, thank you for for listening, and um, stay free. <laughs> that was lovely, Daniel. Thank you, and yeah, and such a lovely intro to the second part, uh, and. Does anybody wish to ask or comment about anything regarding uh, just Daniel's? Just say thank you too, because this rings a lot of bells and like, yeah, uh, it's very relatable. And uh, I mean, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, Gary was going to say something, sorry. Oh, but no, sir. Oh. No, you are not on mute, but we cannot hear you. No, but we can see your the signals with the fingers. Yeah, we can see you. <laughs> so it looks like you're saying something important, but we cannot hear anything about it. Oh, yeah, and Chuck did leave like a long time. And then uh, Chuck says something. Yeah. So uh, maybe does anybody wish to read Chuck's message because it looks like kind of relevant. I, I don't mind. Let's see, uh, did that fix it? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So maybe if it makes sense, uh, maybe Daniel, would you like to read Chuck's message because it is kind of relevant, I think. Uh, sure. If I can find the. Oh, okay. Uh, Chats in the chats, right? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to read it. Uh, no, I mean, I think my microphone or camera will never last long enough to say this, but I think I have a similar perspective motivated by my recent boomerang from industry to undergrad back to industry. There are many yeah. projects, uh, passes, interpreters, compilers, OS, etc., that when done in the large are. Uh, multi-year engineering efforts, but when done in the small, 
with boot constraints or undergraduate assignments that you expected to complete over the course of a semester within a week or two. But the curriculum is really structured to give you a chance to synthesize it all. And once you leave academia, it becomes taboo to build anything yourself until you reach a scale where it suddenly becomes foolish to use anything you didn't build yourself. But only a limited number of people know how, how because nobody else has opportunities or tools to build an experiment. I've been hoping to build similar tools to expose primitives in the database space for learning exploration and maybe real things one day. Thank you very much for this uh, comment, Chuck. That's very um, on point. Yeah. Uh, any other comment or question about that? So if you guys can hear me this time, <laughs> yeah. I was just gonna say, uh, thanks for that background context, Daniel. I think that was a, a really did a great job of laying the foundation for what I wanted to talk about today and where a lot of the motivation comes from. Um, <clears throat> so as you had said, uh, well, so you mentioned this concept that was coined by Cory Doctorow um, called software and shitification. And actually there was a presentation given at uh, the Libre Planet conference uh, just a couple of months ago on that very subject. subject. It was called software and shitification uh, or not. It's not a hard choice <laughs> by, uh, what was it? It was uh, Alexandre Oliva, I think gave that talk. And so he was talking specifically about that problem that we see where kind of the promise of the internet, uh, of the free and open internet that we all saw in the 90s uh, has sort of eroded over the course of the 2000s and to today, as we've seen mega corporations um, take over larger and larger chunks of the, of the web space or of the internet space in that first and foremost, um, <clears throat> we've seen the World Wide Web the HTTP and HTTPS protocols really dominate and take over many of the roles that were previously held by a great many other protocols that we used to all use, at least I used to use, <laughs> like FTP and SFTP and um, IMAP, POP, IRC, all these kinds of things, right? We, we used to do these things with different protocols. Each protocol had its own purpose. They were all open protocols, which means anybody could implement a server or a client for it and you could then jack into the rest of the system. There was nothing proprietary about these network protocols. And these were you know, application layer protocols above the TCP IP uh, stack that you were talking about already. Um, and so in that application layer protocol space, there used to be a great heterogeneity, a great diversity of protocols in wide use among computer users for different purposes, whether we were chatting or sending files or we wanted ephemeral chat or we wanted persistent chat, right? Or, pers or persistent uh, document storage and sharing, uh, things like FTP or Gopher and so on. We had protocols for that. But HTTP really became very widespread and became a corporate target, um, I think, pretty quickly in its history in that it, its specific combination of features has lent itself really well to marketing and advertising and therefore to, for creating websites for businesses. Uh, so I think what you get from that and that's, of course, not the only thing that leads to it, but I think that's probably one of the big contributing factors that has led to the rapid growth of the World Wide Web and its dominance over all the other internet protocols that used to have greater parity with it, um, such that now when people think of the internet, a large majority, I, I would think of people outside of, say, software engineers in particular, probably think of the internet as synonymous with the World Wide Web. Uh, at least I certainly hear that in language and conversations with people who are not programmers. You know, I'm getting online, I'm getting on the internet means I'm, I'm using a web browser. Or at least it did up until smartphones then introduced the app idea where basically every web page in the world has now become its own little app that has to be installed on your device and they communicate up and down. But stepping back again, just to the web, the web is this, has become this monster platform that has kind of eaten all the other roles that were handled by other protocols before. Now we have webmail clients that you're going to use instead of using your old email client that spoke IMAP and POP and SMTP. You have chat clients in the browser you're using Slack uh, and things like that instead of going and using IRC, <laughs> which is a perfectly good chat client with all the features that, that uh, one might have wanted. Uh, and, and on and on and on and on. Um, right? So <clears throat> we all know this. We've all lived through this. And so the web is this rather large beast these days. And because it has so many features and it tries to be everything to everyone, the web protocols, the HTTP 
stack itself is thick. And thus implementing a web server, as Daniel said already, can be very, very daunting, basically impossible. Uh, you, can, you can write a, a toy server, uh, something that, that implements a small amount of the overall HTTP functionality. Daniel did a great job of walking through the standard functionality of just serving up uh, pages through his uh, in his blog post. But obviously, as soon as you go a little bit outside of that and you start trying to implement all the underlying functionality that you need for all the HTTP headers, of which there are a great many, you have to keep track of things like socket uh, <clears throat> connectivity management through Keep Alive headers. Um, you have to look at cross-origin resource sharing, cores restrictions for uh, you have, in your redirects. You have to look at uh, how you're going to manage cascaded file downloads or cascaded uh, link uh, downloads that are coming off of a resource like a, an HTML page that needs to pull in images, JavaScript, CSS, fonts, images, everything else to render it. Do you run that through the same socket connection? Do you have to open multiple connections and multiple sessions? So then you look at these, like I said, like the keep alive type features you have to implement. You have um, cookies for user tracking. You have super cookies that cross sites, and uh, you have referrer headers, and on and on and on and on and on. Content length, cache length, all these kinds of, of things you have to put into HTTP requests. And if you want to implement all of that correctly in your web server, your code is going to get longer and longer and longer forever, <laughs> basically. And that's just with HTTP. You haven't even implemented WebSockets yet. Didn't you forget about your WebAssembly? And then remember all your front-end tech you have to implement for making a browser. you got to get your HTML rendering. But are you doing HTML 302, HTML 401, XHTML transitional, XHTML strict, HTML 5, or newer tech? Cascading style sheets, version 1, 2, 3, or newer? Which version of JavaScript? And how many are we going to support? Um, what are we going to do in terms of graceful degradation with broken HTML, CSS, or JavaScript that doesn't render correctly in the page? And so on and so forth. So, the stack of specs required to implement a web browser and web server pair is enormous. It's, it's reached the scale, it reached the scale a long time ago, where it can't be implemented by a single person anymore, or even a small team, no matter how dedicated. It's the kind of thing that needs armies of programmers to build. And that's why the only real viable, differentiable web browsers that exist out there these days are built by a small number of corporations, as we know. Right. You are probably right now uh, in <laughs> using a web browser, which is either Chrome or a variant thereof, Chromium on Google, on Google Chromium, Brave, something like that, which are all Chrome, Firefox or a variant on that, like Ice Weasel or Ice Cat or something, which is all just Firefox, right? Or Safari or maybe Opera. You're probably using one of these four browsers or, or maybe you're using Edge, you know? <laughs> okay, so maybe there's five browsers really, right? And they're all, they're all built by armies of engineers with near infinite corporate dollars that have been poured into them over the years to get to where they are today. You can go into your package manager and see lists of web browsers with all kinds of other names like uh, Conqueror with a C or, or uh, Surf or whatever else. But 99% of these or more are all just different UI wrappers around the same couple of engines like WebKit or Gecko or something like that that are implemented by the major corporations. They're the engines inside uh, Chrome and Firefox or Safari, those kinds of things. So you're either you're grabbing that massive bundle of opaque software and then you're putting your new skin on it to make a new browser. So what that puts us in a position of, especially as the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, uh, continues to pull in or to have more and more people sitting on its council who are representatives from large corporations um, who have specific profit motivated interests in, in place. <clears throat> uh, as more of those people land on these councils, we see more and more encroachment on user freedom and the openness of our protocols being baked into the standards of our systems like EME, right? Which encodes DRM, digital restrictions management, into our our standard web protocol stack and has to be implemented by all web browsers. And so if you don't want that kind of tech, you, there's no opt out really uh, for a lot of these things because they're, because again, as I said, you can't simply rewrite a, a new client or a new server. It's not, it's not realistic. 
you can you can make it's great for in, in for projects and trying to learn something about how they work, but you can't implement the whole spec. Uh, and that means you can't make something that will really be able to consume or serve any substantial portion of the existing World Wide Web. So, yeah, that's the state of the world today. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's made more challenging uh, for folks who uh, are interested in the free and open internet and proliferation of ideas around that because not only it, are the protocols we're using and therefore the implementations of servers and clients of them out of reach, but large chunks of the internet are now, uh, or large chunks of what would have been done on the internet previously in decentralized pages have now been centralized into these gated communities owned by corporations like Facebook, for example, or Twitter X, right? Or Instagram or something like that. These social media sites have kind of, again, con accreted together all of these features <laughs> that used to be distributed around many different sites. So now, unless you have an account with this particular corporate entity, you're not going to get your information in and out. So where does that leave us with a decentralized web and the possibility of greater hackability, greater self-control, or, or that is not, not uh, the ability to control things yourself is what I mean to say, <laughs> um, right? A more resilient internet and a more uh, diversified internet. Well, one, one path forward uh, are the creation of these decentralized uh, Fediverse protocols. Uh, Daniel alluded to that. So there are tech, uh, there's a lot of tech out there these days and a lot of communities built around decentralized protocols uh, for social networks, for example. You can look at things like Secure Scuttlebutt or Mastodon, Status, uh, StatusNet, and these things which are based around the, the open pump.io and ActivityPub specs, uh, which allow you to host your own little node in the network, just like you would host an IRC node, for example. You can host your node in the network where people can sign up on it and post their information on that like you would say, Mastodon is like Twitter, right? But it's decentralized. So if you were getting on their major account and you post your whatever it is you want to post there, you can subscribe to other people's accounts that are on other Mastodon servers. So everybody's not on one central server room by one corporation, but they all communicate with one another and can pass information between themselves using this de these decentralized Fediverse protocols. So that's one uh, initiative or it's a set of initiatives that have been out there for quite a while now and have gotten pretty mature and have a pretty solid user base. Um, and other approaches are, are some of these uh, smaller protocols that people are working on to create alternative spaces for people to be in uh, as alternatives to web spaces right now. So that's where Gemini sits. And that was the subject of today's talk. Um, so does anybody have any questions about background or motivation before I dive into the actual Gemini stuff? Going once, going twice. All right, here we go. So let's do this thing. <clears throat> All right, so let me do my screen sharing. Step. Pow, pow, pow. All right, is my screen coming through, folks? All right, great. All right, so let's take a look at this site here. <clears throat> Very flashy, as you can see, <laughs> like all of Gemini. All right, so what is the Gemini protocol? So, <clears throat> all right, so Gemini is a new internet technology supporting an electronic library of interconnected text documents. It's how it sort of phrases itself here on this site. The, the key idea is that uh, Gemini was created back in 2019. Uh, by It was initially created by a, a developer who goes by the handle Solderpunk. And so Solderpunk was a longtime Gopher user, right? And so anybody remember the Gopher protocol in the early 90s? Anybody ever used that before? Pretty old timey. I'll show you some Gopher today. <laughs> right on. So, all right. So Gopher was this protocol created in the U.S. at the University of Minnesota as a means of uh, kind of being a step above FTP. All right. So they this was before HTTP was created. So Gopher was invented as a protocol. Uh, it was supposed to be this neat uh, sort of interconnected web of documents, pages, like websites, like we're used to now. But they were called Gopher holes. Yeah, after the gopher, which is uh, it's a large rodent that lives in the U.S. in grasslands and it, it digs underground. 
yeah, lives in holes underground called gopher holes. So anyway, uh, it's also a play on words in English because uh, you go and get a thing. And so that you'd say, I'm going for it. I, I'm go, go for it, go for, go for it, go for. Yeah. So that was it. And then sometimes, uh, Sometimes in English, we, we use gopher as a slang to mean uh, a person who's who's going and grabbing things and bringing them back to a job site. Like if I'm a carpenter, I'm building things. You're my helper. You're my gopher. Your job is to go get the tool that I need next. Yeah. OK, so that's where the name comes from for any non-native uh, English speakers. So anyway, <clears throat> gopher was a protocol for going and fetching a document that you wanted to see. And being able to click from a link in one page into another page and click a link on that site to go to another page and so on, as opposed to navigating around directories of files like we would in FTP, right? So it's just it's just to be a nice level above that. Now, this has an experience very similar to the World Wide Web we know today, except it was all plain text. Now, uh, so that was created first. And then HTTP came out shortly thereafter when Tim Berners Lee released it in 1994 and uh, implements the same concepts, but used a different markup language and extended the, the set of headers you could use in HTTP requests and responses and so on over Gopher's much simpler protocol. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, HTTP took off. Gopher did not. <laughs> it's still around, uh, but it's kind of an indie protocol. It, you know, So uh, there are a bunch of old uh, programmers my age and a little older who still have their own personal sites as Gopher holes where they store stuff you know, files, blog posts, whatever, things about themselves. Um, but it's it's not a super popular protocol generally, right? We know the web kind of took over that space. All right, so that Gopher community is still around is my point. And so that Gopher community still being around and consisting largely of computer programmers. Um, there's a lot of tech knowledge in that space, a lot of crusty old Unix knowledge. <laughs> and so... One of these Gopher programmers named, or who goes by Solderpunk, decided that it was time to build a better Gopher protocol. It's been several decades. He was really frustrated with the World Wide Web and, in particular, the growth of these big social media sites, the corporate uh, centralization of our protocols, and the inchitification, as Daniel said, of a lot of services that are available in that way of privacy tracking, data collection, user spying, all that kind of stuff. And we wanted to have something else, something better that they could use. Well, Gopher was already there, and they were already using it, but it wasn't super popular. Also, Gopher, being a very old protocol, was invented before SSL or TLS. So it's not encrypted, right? Just like plain text HTTP. So, so Solderpunk uh, thought to himself, I need to make a something that's better than Gopher, but much less complicated than HTTP. You wanted something in the middle, yeah? And this is where the name comes from for this protocol that he invented called Gemini. So <clears throat> he related this back to uh, the, the space missions of the United States uh, space program, NASA. And so our, our first space flight was called Mercury, um, okay? Our, where we sent a capsule up with a person, orbited the Earth, and then came back down. The US's second space flight program was called Gemini. And this was just a slightly bigger uh, capsule that went up, orbited for a while with some people, did some analysis, and then came back down. And then the next one was Apollo. And that's the big one where we went to the moon. Yeah. So what he decided is in his metaphor, Soderpunk's metaphor here was that Mercury was kind of like Gopher, the first attempt at this, but very simple. First attempt at space flight. Apollo is the web. It's the big one. It's the one everybody knows about. We landed on the moon. We dig big, complicated stuff. It has a lot of bells and whistles. Gemini was right in the middle. It set the stage for something bigger like the web, but didn't go all that far. So, so this is his. Uh, this is the reason for his name, right? It went with Gemini, and he's quite fascinated with space concepts. So, the the place, uh, the the collection of all Gemini capsules, uh, a, a page in Gemini space is called a capsule instead of a website. Yeah like a space capsule. So you have Gemini capsules. The collection of all Gemini capsules is called Gemini space. Yeah, and the protocol that connects them together is called Gemini. And the native markup language of the protocol is called GemText instead of HTML, yeah? All right, <clears throat> so what is it all about? So Gemini as a protocol gives us this 
web of, of markup language documents. You can jump around from resource to resource via links like the web. There's uh, every single request is encrypted uh, using TLS, right? So every request response back and forth, there's no plain text version like there is HTTP versus HTTPS. So just always encrypted, you know that. And crucially between uh, versus HTTP, an HTTP request has a potentially very large number of request headers, which can include lots of user fingerprinting information. And the responses can also contain a whole lot of headers, which can include things like cookies and so on and so forth that can be used for user tracking. Okay. In Gemini, the request and response protocols are brought down to the absolute barest minimum information that needs to be communicated between the server and client. So the entirety of a Gemini request is the URL. That's it. There's nothing else. So when I ask for Gemini colon double slash Gemini protocol dot net, that is the request and done. Okay. There's no content type. There's no, uh, you know, cache length. There's no refer. There's no cookies. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing else there. There's just the URL. That is the request. The response from Gemini for every request type is a single line of metadata followed by the body, if there is one. The single line of metadata includes a status code and a text string. And that text string uh, contains a specific piece of information necessary for each status code. For example, if you send a redirect code back to the browser, a redirect status, the text string will be the URL that you're redirecting to. And that is it. There's nothing else. Right. If you're sending an error code, like a server error code back to the browser, the status error is the status code. And then the string, the text string, is simply your error message, like your exception message, for example, that you want to send back. And for a successful request, the status response comes back the, the OK status, which is 20 in, Gem, in Gemini. The text string is the MIME type, so that your client knows what it should be rendering. This is gem text, this is HTML, this is PDF, this is an image, this is uh, you know, an AVI image or movie file. And then the body is the actual stream of bytes containing the body. That's it. There's no other information. The result of a protocol with a completely stripped down header uh, set uh, like this and mandatory TLS encryption is that the protocol is extremely private and uh, difficult to trace. Um, essentially, the only information that's being exchanged between that could be tracked anywhere uh, would be on the server side, right? So your browser is making a request to the server. That request is itself encrypted. So anybody sniffing the traffic can't see what you're asking for. Um, the server uh, who is receiving the request can see what you asked for, but it's just a URL, right? It's not like it's some secret new information. It knows what pages it can serve you. So the only thing the server can really track about you is your IP address, what resource you requested, and at what time, right? But of course, if you use something like a VPN or Tor, then the IP information is useless, and therefore, you know, it's a it's a wholly private experience, right? And that's really all you would need. Uh, so, so you have this secure protocol. There's no cookies, so there's no user tracking. There's no user data to track, and so on. And so it's a it's really a very uninteresting target for businesses and for corporations because advertising is not really going to work very well. Uh, it's not flashy marketing on that platform. And so by design, it's sort of set up in a way that it's really just interesting for people who want to share information with one another uh, as opposed to people who want to market to one another. Although you can certainly use word of mouth talking about the things you're interested in, sharing links to one another uh, about interesting projects, and that's what people do. So it's used for blogging and uh, for uh, hobbyist sites and explaining how something works and so on and so forth, that kind of stuff, games, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so this is not a very interesting visual. Let's get into interesting visuals, shall we? Um, but this is the current page, GeminiProtocol.net, is where Soderpunk eventually moved uh, this proxying of his Gemini page that discusses what this thing is, news, documentation, history, and so on and so forth about it. There's an FAQ here, which explains some of the background on where it came from, what were the motivating factors in this protocol. Uh, and one of the very most important ones was making the protocol simple enough that it could be implemented by a single developer in a short amount of time, a, uh, a weekend, a week, a couple of weeks, something like that. 
we want to have the point was to have a protocol that would not ever get lost and captured by corporations and not be re-implementable like HTTP is now um, by by end users, at least in its complete form. We wanted something that would would be decentralized and re-implementable and resilient as a protocol by design. So this is all kind of described inside any of this stuff if you guys wanted to read about it in your own time. Um, but <clears throat> By the way, Darren, uh, yes. we have about 10 minutes to the official mm. time, and then some people may need to leave, but you are sure. very welcome to keep going afterwards if you wish to tell more. Yeah, just Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. It was a bit of a long uh, intro. I, <laughs> thank That's you for great. that. Amazing. Um, just please uh, kind of take your sure. time. Just some people may Thank you for that, Daniel. So let me show you guys some actual examples of interesting stuff here then. All right, so um, so this is, a, this is a site, this is dev.sigis.com. This is my, uh, so I said, I, I'm the director of environmental modeling and software at the company I work for. I have a team of about 20 engineers uh, who work with me writing these simulation models and web apps and so on and so forth. We need a team wiki. So <clears throat> I decided I wanted to host that team wiki on Gemini. This is my company's Team Wiki for the software developers. All right, we call it DevDocs, maximum information, minimum latency. Now I'm proxying this through the web here, but this is a Gemini site. So look then at what that looks like. So if I were going in here, uh, I could go over to devdocs.com. Here it is. So this is me looking at it in Elfer, which is an Emacs Gemini client. Yeah, there's a bunch of them out there. Uh, Lagrange is very popular for people who like GUIs. Amphora is a terminal one, like a incurses type one. There's dozens and dozens of these. So anyway, I'm using an Emacs uh, Gemini client called Elfer. I'm connected, as you can see, to Gemini devdocs.sigdis.com, which is my site here. And this is the kind of content that I get back. So GemText, which is the native markup language, uh, here's here's the markup uh, for this particular site. This is the this is what was actually sent back. From the server. Okay, so we have the, the MIME type line here. So it was text Gemini, UTF 8. So it's full Unicode support. So any language can be represented here. You can write Chinese or Korean glyphs in there. You can use any of the diacritic marks that you need for other languages. You can use Cyrillic, all that kind of stuff, right? And that works just fine. It looks a lot like Markdown for po folks who are familiar with that already. You have the triple back ticks allow you to delineate a pre formatted block. Um, a single line of text is a paragraph. Uh, if you just keep writing on one line, that whole line will be reflowable regardless of the size of the screen, which makes it um, work fine on mobile phones, tablets, uh, and on big screens, which works great. Uh, so that works. Uh, that's a nice accessibility feature. So you have paragraphs of text. You have headlines, which are the typical pound sign at the beginning, like you would expect to see. Um, and you have links, which are kind of the, the interesting feature. These links look like gopher links. So the idea is uh, there's no inline links in GemText. There's just uh, full line links. And that's because it's a line-oriented protocol, not a tree-oriented nested protocol like HTML is. So a renderer for this only has to look at the first three characters of any line to determine the line type and then knows how to render it. And you can just process this through any kind of screen reader that you want to write. Enclosure, for example, that just reads one line at a time of the response from the server. You check the first three characters, and that will help you figure out if it's a pre-formatted block, if it's a header, if it's a bulleted list, um, if it's a block quote, or if it's uh, a link. And that's about the only types you have. Uh, so the link syntax has this little uh, link marker. You have the URL you want to point it to, and then the rest of the line is the label for the link. <laughs> OK, so that was me just rendering the the contents uh, or showing this, the, the source code. So obviously ASCII art is the way to go in this world. I can click this link here and I can go through and see a sort of lovely page or uh, which I share with my developers. Here I have these green links are going to Gemini pages. The orange link goes back to the web so I can, can link over to an HTTPS document as needed. Um, <clears throat> I use this post you know, information about various applications that we work on. So I can include forges and URL links, kind of stuff about our applications, where they're hosted, all that kind of great stuff, right? So this works uh, really quite well for whatever we want to do. So this works as a team wiki. 
And the reason I like this is because, and chose this approach, is because the tech is ultimately incredibly simple. There's a Git repository that's private that my developers all clone to their machines so they can use an offline first workflow. Um, so if you don't have an internet connection or you're traveling or it's spotty, like it could be with me and my, uh, my satellite internet connection, it doesn't matter because I always have the whole site on my computer in that repository. So there's a Git repo, contains the, the, the contents of the site of the capsule. Great. And then I have my server called SpaceAge written in Clojure. And that thing serves up the contents of this site so that I can view it in my Gemini client. There's no other tech necessary. And so when, when I want to deploy it to a remote host, I just run SpaceAge as a service on that machine. I put the repo on there and I set up like a GitLab CI CD job or a Jenkins job. So whenever I whenever somebody merges a change into that repo, it just pushes it to that repo and boom, it's it's fresh on the site. There's no database, there's no MySQL database, there's no complicated PHP CMS like WordPress or Moodle or something like that. There's no Apache server that I have to set up. I don't need that whole stack of things to make a, a web-based wiki. Um, I don't need to work in a web browser for the editor or anything like that. To edit the contents of this, of this wiki, to contribute to the site, people use their editor of choice. They use Git for the version control. All changes will be version controlled on our wiki and go through peer review, right? Um, I can revert changes, obviously, using Git. And everything is just served up natively with my one little closure server. It's as simple as that. So I love the simplicity of the stack and the ease of writing all these kinds of documents because, as I already mentioned, the, the contents of the documents look uh, a lot like what you would expect to see in uh, So it's just not, not difficult to write in these kinds of things. When I look again, look at the syntax. You just have these headers, link lines, paragraphs. You can write Markdown, and you can learn the one link syntax in Node text already. So it's a truly trivial markup syntax. That's the markup itself. A very interesting feature of this protocol, which <clears throat> I would like to share with folks, is how we do authentication authorization. Because this is a protocol that lacks cookies, right? And cookies are the thing that you need to log in to websites. Whether you use OAuth tokens or your Google account or usernames and passwords or, or whatever you're using, the way you log into a web application <clears throat> is that you submit your credentials to the remote server. The server authenticates those credentials somehow. If they authenticate, it creates a session on the server side. It stores a key representing that session in a cookie and sends that cookie in the HTTP response back to your browser where it's stored. Now, your browser will then know to automatically and transparently, without telling you, keep sending that cookie up to the web server on every successive page or link that you access on that, on that site until the cookie expires, right? So that's the nature of a, of a cookie. And some cookies can work as super cookies, like with Facebook, so that, so that even when you're looking at a different site, the cookies will be transmitted back to the parent site, which will then be able to that's how some of the corporations are able to track what you're looking at, even when you're not on their websites. OK, so this has no cookies. It can't track you, which is great. But it seems like it would be hamstrung, because how in the world can I persist my identity, my login, on a site if there is no cookie? Well, the way we do that is we, we use an, a largely unused feature of TLS that's already in the basic transportation uh, or trans Transport layer security protocol, right? For those who use to encrypt things like HTTPS, yeah, or SSH, when you use that to connect to a server, the encryption is done via the SSL or TLS protocols. TLS is the successor to SSL. Okay, so the encryption happens from those libraries. Now, Gemini always uses these libraries by default, right? So every Gemini request is encrypted. But that protocol <clears throat> has in it uh, some features that are not used in HTTPS, but are used in Gemini, specifically something called client certificates. And that's what I leverage with this operations link here that I want to show you guys. So for uh, those who don't know, them, and this is time, yeah, Daniel. I'll just stop you for a moment. Uh, uh -huh. Now we are around the official. And maybe in a few minutes, you would like to kind of take a moment to uh, stop for questions and see if anybody has a uh -huh. comment. And then keep going as much as you okay, want yeah. afterwards. Okay. 
Perfectly reasonable, Daniel. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, that's a great segue then. Before I talk about that, does anybody want to ask any questions about anything that I've talked about so far in terms of sort of Gemini history and motivation, naming, gem text, stuff like that? Maybe um, I remember reading the the uh, the the review of uh, Stein, Steinberg, I think is his name, the guy with the, from Curl, mm. big uh, big guy. Yeah, uh, he, he he looked at Gemini and made some uh, criticism, mm -hmm. uh, but it was all done in good faith, I think, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that he said was that gem text should have been separate or something like that. I don't really know. I don't remember. I mean, mm -hmm. but if you know, if you if you're familiar with the what with his uh, criticism, then maybe you can uh, lay it out. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a good point, Daniel. Uh, so curl is a command line tool that can be used to send various network requests using a variety of protocols to then download files. That's a pretty common tool used in people who are doing network programming. We use it at my job pretty frequently. Uh, curl does not have any Gemini support. Uh, the developer didn't add that yet. Uh, you're right. He had some feedback back to the protocol group. The So about GemText in particular, I should note Gemini and GemText are separate things. And it's true that the, so the Gemini protocol itself just dictates how server and client interactions work. And there's a separate gem text specification. But uh, I think at the time that that feedback was given, they were all kind of placed in the same set of documents. And since then, uh, they've been reorganized by Solderpunk and the protocol committee for Gemini, so that gem text is specified in one place and Gemini in another place. So they are two clear different protocols at this point. In, in terms of, well, I mean, gem text is not a protocol, but its specification is made clearly independent in the current documentation. So that might be an older uh, comment that you're referring to, Daniel. Yeah, that sounds great. So it means it's totally uh, irre irrelevant now. Great. Yeah, exactly. Um, anybody else before I keep moseying along? OK, then let me jump back into it. Uh, let's see. All right, so I've talked a little bit about sort of motivation of this idea of these uh, simple protocols that we can implement ourselves and thereby are decentralized by design. Um, I said what this is, you guys can see it looks like kind of like a web page. I've been text in this case, right? But I'm just navigating around pages by links. Let's see how that works. Like I'm jumping around between a bunch of markdown documents that are linked to each other. It's something like that. <clears throat> Now I told you the protocol itself is hyper stripped down. And I mentioned that we're lacking cookies in the header. So you can't authorize yourself. You can't authenticate anything, which would mean that you could only serve public documents. You couldn't serve anything behind a wall that requires a login. Well, of course, this is a site that I'm, uh, th this wiki here, I made this for my, my software team, right? And so it has private information. So I store secrets information and server configurations and everything else about the servers we administrate in this team wiki. Um, so there has to be some way for me to restrict access. And so here's how we do it in Gemma. <clears throat> so as I said, TLS is the protocol that's used for encryption in HTTPS, SSH, FTPS, and many related technologies. The S part you keep seeing over and over again is that's your encrypted piece, your secure technology. OK, so that TLS protocol, or SSL slash TLS, uh, describes the communication between the server and client like this at a high level. The idea is whenever my Gemini client um, <laughs> makes a request to a Gemini server, this is the same thing a, a web browser does to a web server when speaking HTTPS, by the way. When you make the request, <clears throat> what's going to first happen is the browser sends a request to the server, knocks on the, <laughs> on, the, on the server on the particular port that you want to talk to. So if you think of the server as an apartment building and the port uh, as, the, as an apartment in that building, we go to that server, 
to the HTTPS port, which is 443, or the Gemini port, which is 1965. We knock on that door. If there is a Gemini server listening on that port, it opens up the door and it says, hi, what document do you want? Give me your request. Now, in order to encrypt this, what we do is the web browser set or Gemini browser says, shh, someone might be listening. I can't tell you what I want. First, we must encrypt the communication. And so to do this, they perform a little, little bit of magic called the TLS handshake. And the way the TLS handshake works, generally speaking, uh, is the browser says to the server, I know these encryption protocols. And I, I know these protocols and algorithms. I know SSL version 1.1 and 1.2 and TLS version 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. And I know for my encryption algorithms, I know AES, DES, and Blowfish, something like that. So they give them a pair of these pieces of information. The server responds by saying, well, I know TLS 1.2 and 1.3, and I know uh, DES and Blowfish, right? So they both share what, what languages they speak with each other, basically, yeah? And then they both agree on which of those they're going to speak to each other. So they say, well, we both know TLS 1.3 and Blowfish, so we're going to use that pair. So they start with that. Just like if I were sitting down to talk to somebody and I said, these are the human languages I speak, and they said, these are the human languages I speak, and we say, which one should we use? Let's use this one. So they have that conversation first really quick. Once they've picked the encryption protocol and uh, algorithm that they're going to use, then they exchange a secret key amongst themselves, a, a little passphrase back and forth that's auto-generated. So they basically say a magic word back and forth to make sure that they are, in fact, speaking that to each other. And once they've done that, they have now encrypted their communication. And going forward, they will use that as their seed to continue maintain, having an encrypted conversation for sending the request saying this is the page I want, and sending the response back, giving me the bytes, yeah? That's how they set it up. That's the encryption step. The second step of the TLS handshake is called the authentication step. And this is where the certificates come into play and where we're able to um, actually authenticate ourselves without using cookies, which is pretty cool. So in the authentication step, what happens now is the browser says to the server, all right, no one can hear us talking to each other, but I still don't know if you really are the server I'm trying to talk to you might be a man in the middle pretending to be Clojureverse, right? Are you really Clojureverse or not? So you got to prove to me that you are the Clojureverse server, or I'm not going to tell you what page I was trying to get to. So to do this, the, 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 the server you're talking to has to reach into its back pocket and pull out its ID, and it hands its ID to the browser. This is encoded in a format called an X.509 certificate or an SSL certificate in common parlance. So it hands the ID card to the browser. The browser looks at the ID card and then says to itself, is this real or is this a fake ID card? And it tries to decide if this is a real ID card or not. Now, if the browser decides this, this is real and therefore you are Clojureverse, then it, then it says, okay, you're authenticated. I believe you're the Clojureverse server. So now I'm gonna tell you the page I want is this. So it gives you the request. Now, everything I've set up to this point is how SSH works, HTTPS works, and Gemini works. Same for all of them. All right. Now, the, <clears throat> what's unique in Gemini world, though, is that the server can now turn around and say, oh, you want that page? Well, you're not. I don't know if you're allowed to see that page. Give me your ID card. Only Gemini does that. It's in the TLS protocol. So nobody added anything new to this protocol. Just nobody else is using it. <laughs> so. So Solderpunk, having read the TLS protocol, said, wow, look at that neat feature that no one used. Let's just make use of it. It's already in the libraries. So Gemini servers can ask the Gemini browser, give me your ID card. Prove you're actually Daniel Shmulewicz. Or you cannot see the page. So, so, what, so you, when you make the request, you'll get a prompt in your browser coming back from the server saying, give me your certificate. Give me your ID card. So you have to have generated one on your side. You hand it to the server through your browser. The server will check it and decide, OK, OK, this is Daniel or it's or it's not. Someone's pretending. Yeah? So that's like the username password step. Here, it uses the ID card to authenticate you. And the way you would do this on the back end is you would take it the first time when someone registers for an account. You take a, a snapshot of that, and you'd store it in your database. And then later, when someone gives you that card, you just check it against the database, just like you check usernames and passwords. And if it matches, then you say, good, you can log in. Otherwise, you can't, right? So the back end isn't really any different for us as uh, server programmers. 
It's just that we're receiving an SSL certificate instead of an OAuth token or a JWT token or a username and password or something like that, right? And it works because it's already part of this protocol. So we're just slipping it right across. So that's what you'll see here on my screen now. Uh, so you guys can all see this, right? So these pages, the about section, list of applications and libraries, tutorials for my team, I didn't, I didn't lock these things behind uh, encryption. You go there, you don't have to log in, you can see those pages. But if you want to get to the operations section and you want to see our servers and our server configs and secrets files, you need to log in and need to know that you're actually a member of my team. So let me actually, I logged in earlier, so let me uh, <laughs> forget that. Okay, so we'll refresh here. Um, I have to do a buffer, forget current certificate, boop, and then we'll refresh the page. Okay, so I click the operations link, and when I do that, I get a prompt back from the server. So this is, we've done the handshake, and the server's saying, the Gemini server is requesting a valid TLS certificate. You must present a valid DevDoc certificate to access this page. And at the bottom, my browser prompts me and says, what do you want to do? And so all the Gemini browsers will have this feature where they can either use a certificate that you already put in your collection of certificates, like your personal wallet, or it can auto-generate them on the fly. It can make a new permanent one, or it can, or they can make ephemeral ones. If you want to create a fake identity, use it, and then throw it away after that, after you visit that site. Yeah. So that's what it's prompted me at the bottom. I say I want to use one that already exists. I want to use my DevDoc certificate. So I send it to it. It auths me, and I'm in. And now, <clears throat> the browser will remember to keep sending that certificate automatically for every other page that I visit on this site underneath that URL, just like browsers, a web browser sends your cookie automatically. Yeah. But this is something that can't be used for tracking in the way that cookies can. So that's the key idea. And it's a kind of user account management where the user accounts are built on your computer, not the remote host, right? So you get to control them and can delete them at any time so that they can never be used again. Uh, and now that I'm in, I can go and use different parts of the site for whatever, you know. And so in here, I have information about, you know, servers that we're running and um, what's running on them and so on and so forth. I'm not going to spend all this time here, but you get the idea, right? So I can have like information about our about our machines and how you'd access them, how they're set up, the kind of stuff you'd put on a wiki for internal stuff. And that's static documents, for example. But I can also write um, neat little applications, which are written in Clojure in this case. So I have uh, the script here that runs. And I have to sort of shrink my screen size. Here we go. Tiny. <laughs> OK. So I have this. Um, I have a script here that just ran. So when I visited that URL on the server side, it ran a server side script in, written in Clojure using my Space Age server. And this one did some, uh, it's a core async program that does some parallel IO to go and hit all of the servers uh, that we manage in our cluster that do different things. And uh, it uses different protocols to talk to the different servers and to find out what their current status is and reports it in my left column so I can see which servers are up and which servers are down. So I know which team members I need to go harass to tell them to get their server back online again. <laughs> right. So my, my point is, using this protocol, I can serve static content, or I can do server side programming, uh, a la CGI, the way we used to do in the 1990s for common gateway interface. But this uses a ring like protocol, uh, which is, I think, much more ergonomic. Okay, so that's an example of using uh, Gemini to host, in this case, a wiki that's just version controlled, uh, that includes a mix of static and dynamic pages. There's a whole world of interesting stuff that's out there. There are like, you can go read the Guardian newspaper on somebody else's site. This is a Gemini site here that uh, proxies these web calls and then reformats it into gem text so I can enjoy it in this format in a world without ads, which is great. Um, there are things like LD communities uh, of these Unix servers um, where people like to get accounts on the Unix machines get on there, make their own little page, and participate in little conversations with each other. This is the Cosmic Voyage Tilde server. Uh, it's their Gemini page, where they basically collectively contribute to a, to a sort of sci-fi universe story that they're all telling uh, to one another. Each person is kind of making a post about what's happening you know, in their mind. Da -da 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 -da, transcript begins, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. There are um, pages where people really make use of sort of ANSI art and ASCII art. Uh, and do blogging and all that kind of stuff. There are, I mean, there's so many things on here. <laughs> there are search engines. There are aggregators for blog posts. We have lots of those. 
uh, so that you can go and read the aggregators here, or you can hook your own aggregator up to it to see, to get constant updates of people's blog posts, updates, and so on and so forth. I'm more interested in others, <laughs> for sure. Um, there's in radio, there's music uh, shared around this way. I mean, there's just, there's a ton of stuff. There's a site called uh, Midnight Pub that I enjoy from time to time, which is a community chat site. People uh, imagine that they're in a pub inside this world called Nightfall City, and there's all these other pages around it, these Gemini pages that make up the different parts of the city that you can kind of move around uh, between. And then inside these, people are talking to each other and holding conversations with conversation threads. You can write replies. You can see more about the person who posted the stuff, et cetera, et cetera, right? They're just pages. One particularly neat site that I really like is called Astrobotany. This is a game written in Gemini. So I think it really does a great job of flexing what the protocol can do. Uh, so the Astrobotany site here, as you can see, has this uh, lovely uh, logo. <laughs> And so Astrobotany is a community gardening uh, game, as it were, but a pretty active community. And so you come down here and you can read the FAQ, or it'll tell you all about how to do the stuff, creating accounts, adding your certificates, and so on and so forth, adding more certificates to your account. So it shows you the whole like registration process using certificate management instead of usernames and passwords. Um, has a news section to give you sort of the latest updates from the developer on new features. There's a leaderboard section, which is dynamic querying the database to find out what's going on with the, with the, with the different users. We'll just plant highest score, all that kind of stuff. So you can see some server-side programming there. You log in uh, using your certificates, as you would expect. So here, it's going to prompt me for my, cert my certificate. I log in with my account. I'm in. Now that I'm in, you have these features. You guys will see that they did the links here using Unicode, Unicode characters, which is kind of cool. <laughs> Because again, UTF-8 is fully supported. So that's a common way to put icons into this, this uh, space. And so here you have these things being grown by this Unix program called Botany, which is quite old, like an old BSD game. Uh, and then you have all these operations you can do on it, watering the plant, applying fertilizer, harvesting it, and so on. And these all lead you down different roads on the page and stuff in the database about your user account, and so on and so forth. Message boards where we talk to each other. You can post a message. Post, you'll get a prompt in the browser like this at the bottom where you can put in freeform text. And then that would get, get submitted and posted, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. There's a bunch of stuff inside here uh, that makes it a kind of very, I think it's a very interesting site because it really shows as, kind of, as much as you could try to get done with this kind of protocol. And um, yeah, on and on and on. So that's some of those examples of some sites that I like. There are, oh, let me pause then again. Questions about any of that? <laughs> what Gemini looks like. Then next I'm gonna look at the, specifically the closure implementation of the protocol. I suppose my, my question might be answered in the, in the next part and in the closure implementation because I was just extremely curious about how do you implement uh, the the um, the authentication in uh -huh. uh, if you have to uh, do a if you rely on a underlying library? So how does that work? How does that look in the client and in the server? Uh, that's that's what I'm uh, curious about. But I suppose you you might uh, touch on that in the next. Time. That's great. Yeah, I will absolutely look at that next. Anybody else? Uh, there is a question. Uh, can you see? How does this auth work, or does it work if you're accessing through a web browser HTTP proxy? That's a great question, Chuck. Um, so the short answer is it doesn't unless you write a proxy authentication uh, feature into your proxy server. So when I am so I use a, I often use a simple proxy server called Rebound, which is also written in Clojure, uh, that will allow me to host a site like my DevDoc site or my personal capsule or anything like that, that are being hosted in Gemini space, but I want people using web browsers to also be able to access it. For those, um, so I run SpaceAge, which is my Clojure Gemini server, over the top of my directory containing the actual contents of the site, right? So I'm running that on my server. 
if you connect to it with a Gemini browser, well, then you can go through the normal auth steps because the browser is set up to send the certificates back and forth. So you can get to authenticated parts of the capsule. Um, if we go via the web, I have, a, I have a second server called Rebound. I didn't write. That's written by another member of the community. Uh, and so the, the Rebound server listens for HTTP traffic. When the request comes in, it simply converts the HTTP request into a Gemini request and forwards it into my SpaceAge server. The SpaceAge server then gets the data, passes it back to Rebound. Rebound converts the gem text or what have you into HTML and then forwards that back to the web browser. So you can see the content in that way uh, in your in your browser. So let me see. I did it like this. Like I said before, here I am on the DevDoc site. This is using a web browser now. So I'm hitting rebound. Rebound forwards it or converts it to a Oh, we did lose your voice for a moment, Gary. Maybe it will be back in a moment after the connection kind of a Gemini request hits oh. my space. So here, can you hear me now? Yeah, you, yeah. You still can't hear me? Yeah, maybe you can. Now could. you can. OK. It's if it's good. bad, let me know. I just want to refresh again. OK, one second. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah, thanks. OK, sorry about that. I'm, I guess this is blipping occasionally. Uh, let me bring my screen back up. OK, can you see my screen again? Yes? OK, yes. cool. All right, great. So as, as I was saying uh, before I got cut off by Elon Musk, um, <clears throat> what I was trying to say here was uh, uh, you see here I'm, I'm serving up the same site, uh, DevDocs, here on devdocs.sigris.com, right? And so when I'm clicking around through the public parts of the site, the unauthed parts, uh, it's not a big deal uh, because, of course, it's easy to convert the HTTP request to a simpler Gemini request and back again. Uh, so it goes in, it goes out. I can see these pages. I can navigate around. I can see the source code, embedded pieces, instructions, how do you create certificates, yada, yada, yada. Like I said, it's just like reading any blog post. It works just fine. But if I try to get to the authenticated section, it's going to get stuck. And that's because my HTTP request, like Chuck was asking, goes to the proxy server, Rebound. Rebound converts it to a Gemini request and passes it in to the to SpaceAge. SpaceAge goes to perform that TLS step and goes, wait a minute, where's the cert? <laughs> you have to give me a client certificate. So it sends the prompt for the client certificate back to the browser. But in this case, the browser, the client, is the proxy server. So the proxy server receives that, doesn't know what to do with it, and it passes it back to you. And HTTP does not give us any way to pass an SSL certificate through the browser this way. So if you. So what that does, of course, is it means that <clears throat> uh, this was actually a feature that I appreciated <laughs> because I didn't want just any rando to be able to get to the operations section of my sites where I have my secrets. So um, my <laughs> what this did was it set us up so that if people wanted to share some of the tutorials around or links with information about some of our applications with clients or other team members within the company outside of the software team, they could do that by giving them HTTP links to the public pages. But any of the software team members who wanted to actually access the secret data, the, the operations data, would need to install and use a Gemini client with an auth certificate that I had added to the database and authenticated, right? So I was, so I forced them to use the protocol if they were going to access the secret data. Could you do a workaround? You could, Chuck. I, if you wanted to do that, what I would need to do is I'd have to go into my HTTP proxy server, and I would need to add an extra branch, add a conditional in here, to say that if a request, uh, if the response uh, from the Gemini server says that it needs a client certificate, then I would need to create a form page probably and send that back to the browser. So instead of sending the this, I would send this and I would in, I would have it inject a form like a file upload form here, and then you would just upload the file using HTTP. And then when it goes back, I would have the I would again add that route to my proxy server so that it receives the SSL cert. And it would then just package it in the TLS step. So that's that's how I would have to do it. But you would need to add an extra route for that uh, to both prompt with the form and then to convert the form in into the TLS certificate that goes in the request. So it's doable, uh, but it wasn't worth it to me for this case. I'm curious because if you um, proxying through HTTPS, then you have the 
the browser has the uh, certificate that you might be able to, mm. to use. The browser has the server certificate, but the browser does not have your client certificate because you don't you don't make them. They don't exist in HTTPS. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chuck says, can you translate the Gemini cert request to a TLS client certificate request at the proxy? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, you can. Uh, well, I suppose it could. Um, it is doing the TLS step. It's just that usually browsers aren't configured to do that. Um, but I could imagine doing I'm responding to Chuck's chat message, sorry. Uh, Chuck says, can you translate the Gemini cert request to a TLS client certificate request at the proxy? I've implemented client certs for off using a cert from a smart card or whatever. And the browser can supply a client certificate in HTTPS. So, um, so to respond to both of those together, Yes. So this also ties to what Daniel uh, just said. So HTTPS also uses the same SSL TLS uh, library for the TLS handshake, and therefore has implemented in it the same client certificate feature. It's just not something that most browsers will prompt you for. Uh, so yeah, that's right. Uh, Chuck says, yes, in government scenarios, it's not uncommon, but for consumers, definitely not widely deployed for sure. Absolutely. So you could absolutely configure your browser to accept a client certificate that you've uploaded into it and then send that to certain pages. But that is definitely something that's not an easy to get at feature in most web browsers. Um, so, uh, but, but the answer would be yes, if yours has been configured for that and you have a good way to, to send that via HTTPS, it could absolutely be picked up and forwarded by the proxy server. As long as you can get it from your computer over there, we could, we could inject it into the request. It's not hard. Yeah, no worries. You did not derail, Chuck. That's a good. It was a great question. Um, yeah, so an interesting area for somebody to write an extra uh, patch for one of these proxy servers, for sure. Um, all right. Are you trusting, so, are you trusting uh, the first uh, time somebody comes and presents you with a certificate? Do you say, okay, that's fine. I'm going to save this, or do you force him to uh, use something um, agreed upon? Oh. Uh, which cert do we use? Well, that really depends on your site and how you want to use it. So if I want to implement individual user accounts, then yeah, I'd, I would ask the user to send their cert in, and then it would be added to the database you know, associated with their, their user entry. And then I would check that in the future to show that they've logged in. But I could also make a, like a group cert and just say, everybody gets a copy of the group cert that I deliver via some other protocol. And then everybody here on the team uses this group cert, and maybe I just expire it and change it out every certain amount of time, every month or every six months or something like that. It would work either way um, in this particular uh, method. So this doesn't, doesn't matter. As long as you send me the cert and the cert is in my database, then I can off you. Right. There's such a significance for the first time you present the certificate because this is, this is when you say who you are and then mm -hmm. you, you, might, you, you, you choose to trust it uh, or, or not, and in certain scenarios, you might not want to trust somebody who says this is me. Yes. Okay. That's a that's a that's a great segue into um, something else. Then that I should probably point out. Uh, so, have you guys heard of tofu before? Uh, not the food, but the the protocol. T O F U. Okay. So let's see. We probably talk about that in here somewhere, but. Um, I bet you it uses it in FAQ. Let's see here. Tofu. There it is. Check it out. All right, Tofu. All right, blah, blah, blah. Certificate authorities. Where do they start talking about it? Okay, anyway, they spend quite a lot of time in the FAQ on this site explaining how the, the certs work, how the security model works, so on and so forth. All right, so Tofu. So Tofu stands for Trust on First Use. Trust on First Use. Okay. This is the authentication model used by SSH, right? So anybody who's ever used SSH to get a remote shell on a, on a remote uh, computer, right? You're using Tofu. And so Gemini also uses Tofu. The, <clears throat> so what is this? This is the way that your client, your browser, determines whether or not it can trust this, the certificate that's been sent to it, which I think is what Daniel's asking about here. So in that handshake step, your client sends a request to the server, and we encrypt the conversation. And then the client says, give me your ID card, your certificate, so I can know that you are closureverse.org or that you're devdocs.sugius.com. 
Otherwise, I'm not talking to you anymore because you're a hacker. So in that step, the server sends a certificate to you saying, here's my ID card. And I, I told you that the browser has to then decide whether they trust it or not. Now, I didn't explain how they trust it. I skipped over that step to move forward. But now we're back there now. OK, so when the browser has to decide, how do I, or do I accept that this ID card is real or it's fake, there are different ways of doing that. With a web browser, the standard way of doing this is to is that when you install your web browser, like Chrome or Firefox or something like that, on your computer, it comes with a set of certificates uh, called uh, a trust store, the trust store. And so the trust store is this collection of certificate authority signatures, what they are. So the idea is <clears throat> all the certificates in the world are of one of two types. They're either self-signed certificates. This means I wrote my own ID card. I made it and I signed it myself. This is Gary Johnson's ID card authorized by Gary Johnson. If you trust me, then you can trust me to say that I'm me. That's called a self-signed certificate, all right? The other kind of certificate is one issued by a certificate authority. So there's a small number of org organizations slash companies um, that are allowed to issue these things. These are called certificate authorities. These are groups like VeriSign or Let's Encrypt, right, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And so these groups are allowed to issue authorities, legally allowed to. And so are, they are allowed to issue certificates, sorry. And so you have to buy them from that certificate authority, or you can buy them from a middleman company that buys the certificates from the certificate authority. I mean, there's a whole market of these. But if you want to, if you need a certificate because you are setting up a new HTTPS website, you got to go buy a cert. That's how it's going to work. So you have to go to a certificate authority and purchase a certificate, which will be good for, for example, one year. So you'll pay the money to them. They will give you the certificate. This is an ID card that says, this server is the closureverse.org server signed by VeriSign or whatever, whoever the authority is. Yeah. And it says, uh, issued on this date, expires on this date. That's basically what's on the ID card, on the certificate. They give this to you. You install this into your, your web server. And then in that TLS handshake, every time somebody visits your site, the web server hands that certificate to the browser. The browser looks at it and goes, well, this says you are talking to closureverse.org. This is their certificate. It was issued on this date. It expires on this date. And you go, did it expire yet? No, it didn't. I know you guys have seen that error in your browser that says like this page is insecure, the certificate has expired. Yeah, that just right. The date just ran out on the expiration date on the certificate, and then it says you know authorized by Verisign. So the, your browser decides if it trusts it or not by doing basically three things. First, it checks and says does the name on the certificate match the URL that I'm asking for, right? I look, I I think I'm talking to closureverse.org, but the ID says you know foobar.com. Like wait a minute. You're not Clojureverse. And so then you say, no, no, I'm not talking to you. I don't trust you. If the name on the ID card does say Clojureverse.org, we check the expiration date and make sure it hasn't expired yet. If it has, we say, OK, it's expired. I'm not talking to you. This is an old certificate. Maybe you picked it up out of the trash somewhere. If the name is right and the certificate has not expired, then we look at the uh, the signature for the, for the authority at the bottom. And so you'll say, oh, it's signed by VeriSign. So then you go and look in your trust store, which was installed on your computer with your web browser, and you'll flip through it until you find VeriSign. And you'll pull out the VeriSign signature, and you'll compare it to see if it's the same signature that you have with what's on this ID card. If it matches, good. If not, you say, this, this was forged. And you give it back, and you say, I'm not talking to you. Any of those conditions will make your web browser throw an error, and you'll get that you know one of those pages saying, this, the site is not safe. Do not proceed. And you click advanced and you go there anyway because you can't be bothered. You know, that's what happens, right? So the trust store is how it works in HTTP world. And so it's built on this, this economic model of selling certificates. As I said, you can also make a self-signed certificate and put it on there, but your browser will complain all day long or when when you try to visit a site with a self-signed certificate because it, it doesn't exist in the trust store. Okay, so Gemini, being this indie protocol didn't want to be tied to the economic model of the certificate authority. You can buy a certificate from a certificate authority, and you can stick that in your Gemini server. It will be sent to the browser, and that'll work just fine. Of course, you can do that. Or you can use Let's Encrypt, which will also work as a certificate authority. 
issue them to you and that will work just fine. You can do that all day long and plenty of people do use that uh, to back it up. But <clears throat> you can also use self-signed certificates on Gemini servers and they work just fine. And most of the Gemini space does run on self-signed certificates, which means there's no cost to buy into using the system. That was supposed to be the idea. So how does this work? Well, if you use a self-signed certificate, the way that the browser determines whether it can trust you or not is using this approach called TOFU, trust on first use. And as I said, this is what's used in SSH, the secure shell protocol, when you get a remote terminal on a, on a remote host. So when you guys SSH to a computer, right? You set up the encrypted connection, same steps I talked about before, they do the handshake. Your SSH client asks the SSH server, send me your certificate, you get a copy of it. That certificate, um, <clears throat> what, your, what your SSH client does is it, it maintains a file called, um, you guys know this? You guys have used this before, right? If you're looking in the SSH folder on your computer, home SSH, right in here, there's this file called known hosts. So every time you SSH to a server, you know, some server, whatever that server is, well, whatever, I'm not gonna SSH to a server right now, but you SSH to a server, when you do that, make the connection and your SSH client is, when it gets a certificate, it's going to check the known hosts file on your computer, which is acts as your trust store, to see if there's an entry for that server in there. So a one line entry per server you've SSH to. And that in that line, it'll say the IP address uh, of the machine you were connecting to and its name, and it'll have uh, a string, which is uh, called the certificate fingerprint. It's like it's a hash encoding of the cert. So they put that on there. And so it checks and see to see the certificate I just got from the SSH server, does its fingerprint match what I have in my known host file? If so, good. If not, throw an error. And that's how SSH works. So it's using Tofu. So the way, so the idea is when you receive, when you SSH to a machine for the first time, you get their, their server certificate, you check the known host file, there's no entry for that. So the server says, I trust this on first use. I'm just going to trust the first one I got and assume it's right this time. It stores that in the known host file and you connect. I mean, actually, obviously what it does is it prompts you and says, this is new. Do you trust this, this fingerprint? And you say yes, and then it adds it. That's what happens, right? Now, on every subsequent connection to that server, you'll get the certificate and your SSH client will simply compare it with what's in the, in the known host file. If it has not changed, it's still the same, same server. So you trust it. If it, you get a different certificate back, then it throws an error and says, eh, eh, not talking to them, man in the middle attack. And that's what Gemini does. So it adopts the same approach from uh, called Tofu from SSH. So when you visit a Gemini site for the first time, your browser stores the certificate. And on every subsequent visit, it checks a cert against what the one that you have stored locally. And if they don't change, you're good. And whenever it changes, you'll get a message in the browser saying that cert changed. Do you want to accept the new certificate or do you not want to visit this site? And so that's how you do it. OK, that's the answer to that question. Next question. Have we done enough encryption? You guys want to see some closure? We got some closure. Yes, sure. All right, here we go. And Chuck, did Chuck have a message? Oh, sorry. Trust on first. Use. There you go. Put it in the chat there for you. Guys, trust on first use. Tofu. There you go. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, so that, this is something that makes my implementation different than what Daniel did in his uh, blog post, right? He showed us how to set up the sockets and make the connections, and then I have on top of that this all this encryption stuff that I'm talking about uh, that's necessary for Gemini. So this is Space Age. I look here, uh, Chromium two. Okay, Space Age. And back in my web browser. This is the repo, which is linked in the Clojureverse uh, posting about this talk. So SpaceAge is dun, da, 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 a Gemini server written in Clojure. So I wrote this uh, back in 2020 when I was participating in the Gemini community on fleshing out the spec. Uh, there was not a, a server written in Clojure. And I thought that there needed to be one. <laughs> the, the main server-side programming model that people were using was CGI, Common Gateway Interface, which was popular in the 90s. The model there is that you send a request to your remote server. <clears throat> if the route that you're requesting in your request points to a script, 
written in any language, Python, PHP, Perl, Tickle, you know, your choice, Clojure, yeah. Then what it's going to do uh, is the web server would create a subshell, set up a bunch of environment variables that would hold different parts of the request in them, of the HTTP request, and then it would call your script with those environment variables set. Your script would then need to read those environment variables and print all the HTML that you're going to produce to standard out. The web server collects up that HTML, puts in an HTTP request and or a response, and sends it back to the browser. That's how we did server-side web programming in the 90s and early 2000s. You can still do it. And so that's, that's the common model in Gemini. So people who are working in Go and Ruby and Rust and whatever they want to do on the server side, they do the CGI model. I didn't want to do that because I thought Ring is such a beautiful abstraction that we already have. Let's use Ring, except not because Ring is for HTTP. But let's, let's keep that idea that what we're going to have is a handler function that re receives a request map and returns a response map. And that's all we need to do to do these Gemini uh, programming problems. OK, so Space Age was my contribution to the community. It is written with zero dependencies. You, it's just Java and Clojure. That's it. It's not using any of the libraries. It's very minimal. Uh, all the programming is done with the Clojure standard libraries and the Java standard libraries. That's it. <clears throat> so good. Now. To create a TLS certificate, to do this, you have to make a certificate for your server, right? As we said, so I, I give you the steps how to do that with Key Tool, which comes with uh, the JDK. So it's already on your machine when you have Java installed. So you can just cut and paste these commands. This will make your cert. And then you would go ahead and fire up Clojure with a couple of Java properties set, and you're off to the races. Pow. Um, I also have instructions here on uh, making it into a jar file and then running it, you know, Java dash jar that way. The readme here for Space Age explains uh, how requests that you would provide to the server will get mapped to files in the file system. Uh, what we do if if it maps to a directory that's empty, or, or sorry, to a directory rather than a file, uh, it'll automatically generate a directory browser for you of the file, so you can click your way through. And then it has, spends quite a bit of time explaining how you can write your own CLJ scripts. So if you want to make a URL like this, localhost myscript.clj and you hit it, uh, you can make that request with or without the CLJ extension. It doesn't matter. It's optional. And uh, when SpaceAge goes to satisfy that request and sees it maps to a closure script, it will, <clears throat> what SpaceAge is going to do is it's going to load the code from that, that closure file into a, a temporary namespace. So it'll auto-generate a namespace name with a gensem and a special prefix. Into that, it will load your source code. It will then scan through and execute the main function in, that has to be defined in your script. And that main function will be handed a request map containing your Gemini request. And your function just returns a, a request uh, a response map. So it's just like ring, a function takes a request map, returns a response map, and that's it. So all you have to do to use this system is just write a CLJ script with a main function that takes a request map and returns a response map. Right? Mm -hmm. Stick it anywhere on the path, and then make the URL request that navigates to your particular file. And that's it. And, and now you're, you're off to the races participating in this protocol. Um, below that, I explain what's in the request map. These are the keys and values, or example values, that, that uh, SpaceAge provides your function. And the client certificate is one of the attributes. It's a submap. And so inside that, you can get all the, feature, all the properties of, the, uh, of that certificate that was uh, sent to you. So this would be the client cert an example of one with all of its fields broken out into a closure map. And then you have to send back a response, which has keys and values like this, depending on what kind of response type you want. So there is an input response and a sensitive input response in Gemini. Um, since it's such a simple protocol, it doesn't have forms. But you can get user input either via the query params on the URL or via this input type. So when they send the request, you can send back an input response saying, OK, but I need more information. So when the browser gets this status 10 response back, you send it a meta string, which is a prompt. And the browser will make a pop up or something that'll say, in this case, enter coordinates. And so then you would type in freeform text. And hit Enter. The request will be sent right back to the, to the browser with this information encoded in the query params. And now your, your uh, server program can process that with the extra information 
that's been collected. Sensitive input will tell the browser to use like asterisks or something like for password input so that you can't see it on the client side. You have your response codes where you get to specify the, the, the MIME type, sorry, of the response body. I should emphasize that Gemini, while GemText is the native markup language, you can serve anything. You can serve HTML with, Gem, with Gemini. You can serve PDFs. You can serve images, video, anything. It doesn't matter. It's a file sharing protocol. So it's quite common to sort of make a page that sort of starts as GemText and then has all the links in it are pointing to like, check out my cool images or check out this other web page that I think is really neat. Or uh, there was a site called Competo.media that had links to uh, mixtapes uh, that were being made by the author uh, in uh, AUG format, yeah, uh, that were on there. So you could click and download those and then play them on your local AUG player or whatever. So any format, so you just have to specify the MIME type and then you give your body, which will be the content that's gonna go back to the browser and the browser will use the MIME type that's been specified to know what to do with it. Some Gemini browsers can natively handle various formats. Others will just do like an XDG call and just throw it out to like a local image viewer or forward it to your web browser or something like that if you click a non-Gemini link. Uh, but that makes it quite nice because you can use the native format for getting a lot of stuff done. And then if you want some, say, complicated math formulas or something, you might just send the PDF as the link for that using some law tech. Uh, we have redirects, a few different kinds of redirects. We have various failure status codes in the 4D series, where again, they're very simple. It's just a status field and the meta is the error message. Um, yeah, these are all different error codes in, this, in the 40s and 50s. And then leading up to the 60 series are the auth codes. So status 60 uh, means that you can't access this resource until you give a client certificate. So that's the response your, your main function sends back. The browser will ask them for a cert. It will call it again. And now your main function will receive a request map with a client certificate, which you can authorize and then do stuff with. Um, yeah. So anyway, the 60 series are the ones about clients. Certificate is required, not authorized, or not valid. You can send those back. And then I have a namespace that comes in space age that's available to all your scripts. So you can require it since it's being run in the context of the same JVM running space age. Uh, and so I have these utility functions inside Space Age that you can use in your script uh, that will auto-generate some of these uh, maps, kind of like the like, ring request utils uh, namespaces that we have for auto-generating responses or attaching the content type or whatever in your threading macros. So the, these do that for us if you don't want to make the map by hand. Um, yeah, so that's basically the programming model. It's pretty simple. Main function takes a request map, all of which are detailed in the readme, response map in the readme, these are all the, uh, the possible options according to the protocol. So I've implemented them all and documented them here. Uh, and I also have this middleware scripts feature. Because we don't implement full-blown uh, routing, so you don't need like secretary or biddy or uh, composure or something like that, uh, in maintaining this very simple file-oriented model, uh, which uh, Gemini embraces, I decided to implement middlewares uh, as files in the file tree. Uh, and so rather than having a chain of functions, if you guys remember in, in ring programming, web programming, a handler function is a function that takes a request map and returns a response map, right? And that is the way it works in HTTP. It's the same model I'm using in Gemini. A middleware function is a higher order function. It takes a request map, or sorry, it, it takes a, um, a handler function and returns a new handler function, yeah? And so middlewares are used to wrap handler functions as closures with an S, with additional functionality that usually either modifies the request map or the response map uh, or does some side effect like logging or something. Yeah, so we can do middlewares. In this case, um, rather than taking your handler function in your closure code and then passing it into a bunch of middlewares, call this middleware on it to get a new handler, call another middleware on it to get a larger handler. So you make a you make this Russian doll thing in Clojure, right? With the handler function in the middle and all the middlewares wrapping around it out, 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 out. So you get this really nested closure with an S at the end uh, that your requests go into. Instead of using that, I set up a linear model inside Space Age. So the idea is we're serving up a directory tree of files, right? So your URL maps to the directories in, in your directory tree. <clears throat> so if I'm trying to visit a page, um, 
like, okay, this is a good example. Okay, so if I'm on devdocs.sigdis.com and I go into our applications and libraries, that link goes to devdocs.sigdis.com slash software. So it goes into the software folder. Because I didn't specify the file, it defaults to index.gmi, which is just like web browsers default to index.html. GMI is the gem text extension. And so that's what it did here. If I keep going in to one of these things like Cameo, it goes in here, it went to the Cameo directory, it again defaults to the index.gmi. And that's for static content, right? But <clears throat> if I go, if I went down this other route, or I can't do that in the web browser, but if I went down that route, remember I get to one of those closure scripts, and when it hits that script, it loads it up, executes the main function with the request map, gets the response map, turns it into a Gemini response, and sends it back to the browser. That's how I get the server-side scripting to work. But in each of the folders leading down to that script, I can stick an index.clj. And so if I put an index.clj file in any of those, that acts as a middleware script. So those also have main functions in them. They'll So the idea is you've requested my site slash foo slash bar slash baz.clj. That's where I'm getting to. But in the foo directory, if I put an index.clj, uh, the way SpaceAge is going to work is it, it actually has to walk the whole directory tree step by step to get down there. And if it finds an index CLJ in any intermediate directory, it will run that, that index CLJ script first. So it'll load it into a temporary namespace, call the main function in it with the request map as it currently looks. And that function can either return a response map, in which case that short circuits the request, bouncing it back out exactly like a closure middleware function given a request can short circuit and return the response, like, like an auth middleware, for example. You could say, oh, we're not going to go any further. You didn't auth. We're bouncing back out. Or the main function in, a, in an index.clj can return a request map. So you get the request. You could augment it and return it back again. So if SpaceAge detects that you returned a, a request map via spec checking, basically, if it sees that you, re you returned a, a request map, it will just continue down the directory tree using the augmented request all the way down. So this allows you to put index.clj's in the way that can add additional fields or change fields in the request until they reach your script, which is the same thing you would do with middleware functions. Or you could do side effects like logging or anything else in those. So this allows us to get the same functionality, uh, but in a linear file-oriented pattern instead of a nested function pattern. And that is, as I said, documented in the README for SpaceAge, where we explain how middleware scripts work with these index CLGJs, what you might want to use that for, and so on. Um, it also has an open-ended MIME type uh, system. So there's a MIME type file that has tons of default MIME types. But if you have other types you want to support, you can add them to the MIME types file before starting the SpaceAge server. And now you can serve your new interesting type du jour. Um, I have a link pointing at GemText markup to show you how to do that. If you just, there's literally six tags. <laughs> it's nothing, nothing much to learn. Uh, and then just some further reading information and license and distribution. It's under the EPL, just like most closure software. So you guys can play with it and extend it and so on. And yeah, that's that's the Space Age um, README. Questions about that? Chat from Chuck there. Anybody comments, questions about the programming model? Well, actually, it's uh, so clear. <laughs> really. <laughs> so, I guess that's the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to keep it simple, guys. That's the yeah, idea. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> really. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right. So, so let's let's run it. So if I ran it, I cloned the repo. I'm sitting here in the space. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, maybe it is a moment uh, to go uh, to stop for a moment. And yeah, and uh, I see Chuck is also writing something. Oh, yeah, he is, yeah. I was wondering uh, this way of organizing middleware with closure files in a directory structure. That's yeah. actually kind of nice. And I haven't seen that happening in other web servers. And I'm wondering. I've never seen that before. Yeah. I was just looking for a model that could do that, that would be extensible because. You know, when you when we write closure websites, um, since I, I write web closure web apps for a living, um, I imagine probably some of you folks do that either for hobby or for work. You know that the model that we we do is <clears throat> we don't really have a closure web server that runs over here and then we give it a document root like you would do with Apache or Nginx or some other off the shelf server. 
the way we write Clojure Web Apps, right, is we pull in server libraries into a bespoke application that we have to write as Clojure programmers, right? And so we pull in like Ring Jetty or something like that, or HTTP Kit. And so we write handler functions, our, our functions that take a request map and return the response map. And we write our own middlewares. And we can do that because we're writing all the, all the core code of our own little standalone server. We're writing the middlewares. We're writing the handlers. We can pass the handlers to the middlewares, gin it all up, put it in a def once or something, right? And then stick and then hand that to this ring jetty function at, at application start time. So it's because we're doing the library programming. But in this case, I was trying to build a standalone tool that would sit in the same space as other web server, or other Gemini servers, sorry, that already exist, which act like things like Apache or Nginx, and that there is a server that someone installs via their package manager, they run it on a port, and it has a config file where they say, I'm serving up you know, this directory, this is my document root. And then that directory on their computer is where they put all the contents of their site. And whenever they edit and save those files, the every, next time you look at them in your browser, you should see the new files. So I had to figure out how to map the ring programming model into a system where somebody would not actually be hacking on the space age program itself. They would just run it. And over here, they would make a directory where they'd put their, their Gemini files and their PDFs and their HTML and their images, anything they wanted to serve as well as little closure scripts for dynamic stuff and be able to do that independently of space age without using it directly as a library. Not that it can't be used that way, but I was trying to make something that would have a lower bar to entry uh, for non, yeah, for non programmers, basically. Uh, so since the middleware functionality, I think is quite useful. Um, I had to figure out how to do it using the file, the idea of serving a, an independent file tree rather than hacking internally on the logic of the of the server. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it totally makes sense. And you actually can, I'm just thinking that you could uh, implement this, uh, this, this uh, file based uh, uh, tree of, um, of uh, middleware, you could, you, you could actually uh, write this in closure for uh, as, as middleware, I suppose. I do. That, they, they are closure middleware functions. Exactly. Yeah. So an example of that, I guess, would be um, like in here. I have all these silly things that I was like toy examples that I showed people before. Um, Where is one of these? That's called uh, uh, cert something? No, parse. Parse cert. Yeah, yeah. Parse cert. OK, this one. So here, this is an example of a middleware function or a middleware script uh, kind of a thing. Uh, or, or it could be. Uh, so uh, anyway, this, this is a cert parser that I wrote at one point to sort of check uh, certificates. So you can sort of receive the request, main function receives request, right? And then pull the client cert field off of it. That's your request. It's just a sub map. And then I return my status out of these things. So it's good or, or it's bad. So on the first request, there, the client certificate will, will be empty because they didn't send it to me yet. So cert is nil, so I return status 60, give me a client cert. The request goes back to the browser, the browser turns around and, and uh, prompts you for the cert, you give it to them, that goes back to the server. Now the server plays the same main function, but now cert is not nil. So I go here, and now I can call my render cert function up above with this unpacked certificate, formats it, uh, you know, and with a format string, and spits it back at them, pow done. And that's how I did. I made my dim text in this case was just using format, right? The, the syntax is so simple. It doesn't need something like hiccup for nested tags because it's line oriented. Uh, so, it, sorry. So that's that's uh, an example of cert parsing. Sorry. Uh, an example of how I did this with um, as a middleware is I took that logic and I went into my um, dev doc site, the guys, the one I'm using for work, right? And so that looks like this. This is this. Uh, Git repo that my, that's private, my team has access to. They can put content into it. They can submit their, their new updates as PRs. We review each other's changes, merge them, and then they get thrown up onto the server and, and displayed on the dev doc site. Now, so this repo basically serves like this document root folder, which is what SpaceAge is serving. And in here, I have index GMIs for you know, the default file if you're navigating to that directory. But if you go to that operations folder, the one that was the link that 
requires a cert. The reason it asks for a cert is because I put an index.clj in here. So any request to anything under there, if you had a URL that was already saved or bookmarked, operations sub something, sub something, sub something, doesn't matter. You made the request, SpaceAge is going to traverse the tree. When it enters operations, it's going to see index.clj, and it has to call that middleware script first before it can go any further. The middleware script uh, says, actually really simple, this middleware script just says uh, this, right? This is a main function. The main function receives the request. Boop, I pulled the client cert out of it. And so what I actually do is I pull a couple of fields out of the client certificate, the subject common name, the serial name, the hash code. I pluck those out. And then I just check to see if this data structure above, which is a hash set enclosure, contains that cert or not. If it does, then I return the request unmodified. So the middleware returns the request. And now SpaceAge can keep going to access the static or dynamic page you asked for. But if I return a response instead, that short circuits and you don't go any further. So the short circuit response is status 60, give me a certificate. So that's how I perform authentication using a middleware script uh, using this system. Very little code, it's like what, five lines of code, plus the actual data structure holding the map, which I could put in a separate file or a database or anywhere I wanted to stick it. It's pretty trivial at that point. Um, that's the middleware scripts. Here, Chuck was commenting on some stuff. He says, is there anything like certificate transparency logging in the Gemini e ecosystem? Um, maybe you could elaborate on that, Chuck. Uh, as I said, you have access to the cert information on the server side. So if you wanted to, in a middleware or otherwise, log the information that's in the cert, of course you could. Um, and that would allow you to then track who's looking at what, right? Just because you can see who's logged in, because you always have the certificate. If you mean something else, um, maybe you could elaborate. The other question was, it might be interesting to explore libraries that help translate from other protocols, especially simple plain text request response or command response protocols into ring-like maps, identifying and evolving or extracting the generic versus protocol-specific fields we learn about along the way. So closure devs could possibly write basic servers against a common interface and offer it over various protocols. Yeah, no, I uh, that's a great idea. Yeah, writing more uh, mappers or mapping scripts to give us ring-like interfaces like Daniel talked about earlier. Uh, to to more protocols. I think that could be very cool for people to work on. Uh, in this case, yeah, I, I invented a ring-like protocol for Gemini. Uh, that is slightly different to to deal to to work around or to make it as simple as I could. <laughs> I didn't want any any additional libraries, and I wanted to stick with that file-oriented structure uh, with Gemini. But yeah, I would totally encourage people to get out there and hack on their other protocol wrappers to open this stuff up. Okay, that was that example, a couple of examples of scripts that look like that. I wanted to run SpaceAge itself. I launch it like this. I tell it to serve any old folder when I want to serve. So you pass it on the command line, the document root folder that you want it to serve. That's it. Um, so I can say serve this, or I could say uh, serve the devdoc site, in which case I would tell it that I want it to serve uh, devdocs document root. That's the folder containing the site. So you just call it, you give it the folder, and it goes forth. You can also tell it to run on a different port. The default port is 1965, um, which is the year that the NASA Gemini mission launched. But, um, but uh, otherwise, you, you could run it on a different port if you wanted to, you know, like that. By passing that as a second argument, it's again all documented in the readme. Uh, but I could do this, and this will just spin it up. So space age, the closure against Gemini server. Of course, it needs an ASCII art banner because it's it's Gemini. Uh, it reads in the MIME types database file that's provided, as I said, in the repo, or a person could extend it with more MIME types if they need to, and it started up. And once it's there, I can fire up my uh, my little thing here, and now I can go to Gemini colon localhost, right. and there you go. So on the right, you see the the request was made for Gemini localhost. It gets logged over here. So I can see the time of the request. And on the, on the left, I get the page. If I'm looking at all my docs. I could do this offline now, right? So that was one of the advantages of this, is uh, this workflow. Instead of needing a team wiki that needs a MySQL database and a CMS and everything that's centrally hosted, since the database of team wiki information is just a Git repo, any team member can just clone it, run SpaceAge on their own server, and boom, they have 
an offline first solution where they can do their own research and analysis, even if they're traveling um, or without an internet connection for some reason. Do the analysis just like with Git, where we can do our work offline and then share it once we're back online. So that's something I wanted to promote with this particular uh, application of Gemini. But yeah, that's that's what it looks like to use it. Um, oh, <laughs> I want to show you guys this. So uh, some people are curious about uh, what can you show in, in Gem text, which is not the protocol per se, but the markup format. Uh, so it is a text-oriented format, but uh, you have headers, you have bulleted lists. Numbered lists are just the numbers, one, two, three, whatever, right? That's fine. Easy enough to do. The paragraphs reflow based on the size of the screen, as I mentioned, so that works really nicely. And uh, it's the content is automatically accessible, so it works well with screen readers and so on. There, we have a number of blind users in the, in the Gemini community that benefit from these kinds of things, because you can imagine that gem text markup is so simple, screen readers can have a much easier time reading it than the really nested divitis uh, content that you end up in uh, with HTML pages. Um, so that that's quite nice. But when it comes to displaying things like imagery uh, or tables and stuff like that, what people do is they do it in ASCII art, and then they put it in the pre-formatted blocks. And of course, if you're an Emacs user, you can just use org mode to make gorgeous tables very easily. And then you can just cut and paste them into your gem text file put the triple back quotes above and below, and you have tables. You can also actually get away with doing uh, LaTeX free math <laughs> this way. So I, I thought it'd be fun to show this to you guys. So if you wanted to show off some math formulas or something in a, a gym text page, the way we would do this, I'm showing, uh, you'd use the, one way to do it is with the Python SymPy package. Here, you could write an expression like this, which you'd run at your, in your Python interpreter, and that'll print out this, right? So you, you just you wrote your math formula here, like so. You hit it, it spits it out, and then you just cut and paste it and put it in the preformatted block. Same thing here. This is a plot command from uh, SymPy, and it makes an ASCII art graph of, of what you're trying to plot, which you can then stick into the gem text. So this makes it possible to move more things into ASCII art world, and therefore into a text-only uh, format, which is really what gem text promotes. Again, reminding us that I can use Gemini to serve PDFs or HTML or Markdown or whatever else if I really wanted to, um, because it's agnostic of the content. But if you want to use the native format, which is very very easy to parse and write clients for, uh, there are a lot of, of uh, smart workarounds <laughs> for, for doing tables and graphs and images and stuff like that uh, using ASCII art with the preformatted blocks. Uh, and source code sharing, of course, works that way as well. Yeah. That should be good. Um, what other things are worth showing you guys? Oh, I have another feature that I put in the server, which is that, um, go back to localhost, right? So this Gemini server is serving up the devdoc site currently, as I said, which is for my company that I, that I use. So that's what's on localhost. But have you guys ever used the public underscore HTML folder feature of Apache before? Anybody remember that? You know, so so if you were trying to host your public, like your personal web page, um, in the '90s or early 2000s, a common approach would be you get this, you get an account, an SSH account or an FTP account, on a uh, on a Unix machine somewhere you're paying for, and you SSH or SF or, or FTP to your account, and in your home directory you make a folder called public underscore HTML. Yeah, and that is recognized by Apache. Uh, automatically, or and some other web servers, uh, as user web pages. So you make a public underscore HTML folder, and you can put any HTML or images or whatever. You can put your site in that folder. If you do that, then even though you haven't paid for a domain name or anything, your site can be reached by pointing your web browser at the URL for the whatever the server is, where that Apache server is, slash tilde your username. And that tells the, the web server, go to that user's account, and serve the site from the public HTML folder. So that's that's still popular in the tilde community uh, today. So I wanted to preserve that feature in SpaceAge as well. So if I'm in my home directory over here, I have a public Gemini folder. So same thing. If you make a public underscore Gemini folder in your home directory, then if you do that on a machine that's running SpaceAge as its uh, server, then 
you can navigate to, you guys can see at the bottom here, Gemini localhost. Uh, and I'm going to go tilde my username, G Johnson. Oh, I think this thing's in the way, isn't it? Got to move that. Yes. Okay, there we go. Better. All right. <clears throat> Let's try it again. So I want to go to Gemini localhost slash tilde my username. And if I do that, boom, that will map to the public HTML folder on my machine, which makes it possible to have your Space Age server serve a main site, but also support uh, personal sites if you want to have a community hub uh, type page. And so in this case, it hits that folder. Because I didn't put an index.gmi in there to make an actual page, it operates as a, a space age will automatically make a directory listing for the folder. So here I can just see what's in it, and I can access it. So I have you know important things like pictures of John McCarthy scowling at us and reminding us, programming, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> right? Get back, get on top of your list programming, guys. Uh, good stuff like that. Um, I have an example showing, uh, illustrating how to do forms, how to implement forms in Gemini in a protocol that has no forms. Um, so you can do that leveraging the input field, uh, the input response. So I can I can make my forms as links, right? Each form, enter this, enter this, it's a link. You click the link, and the links on the back end, my closure function that receives them, just sends input responses to me, saying, OK, enter your name. And so I can see my name is Gary Johnson. As I take that back, you guys can see the response on the right here. So I visited the form page, which gave me the page with the links. And so <clears throat> when I clicked the link for the name, it went to this route here with an auto-generated session uh, ID that it produced on the back end to distinguish me from other users of the site in my database. So the, the link that's passed in here is submitting some of the information that needs to be recorded this way. So instead of using a cookie, we're injecting intermediate programming information in our links, right? This is a neat programming technique from Gopher. So I click the link, it sends this request. The response from the closure code sends an input response back to me saying, "Give me, send me your name. When I typed it in in my browser, the browser replays the same link, but after the question mark, adds my input as the query parameter, right? So that goes to the server. My closure function receives it, parses it, says, oh, there's a name, cool, stores it in the database updates the link set and sends it back. So now that the label of this link now contains my name, right? And so if I, I looked at the link at the bottom of my screen, uh, you can see what's in that link, uh, form.clj slash session slash name and so on. It still says that if I wanted to reset it, but the label has now been updated for the text. And I could you know, do the same thing. You ask for a password and I can say my password is blah. Here. I've sent the server sent a sensitive input response to the browser. So you see I'm getting asterisks. So I can type a password in safely. And now my password is saved. Awesome. Uh, it's asking if smog is great. And this, this was me. Uh, so I was trying to show a plain text form, a oh, we lost your voice. password type form, a Boolean form, like a, where one is automatic. I'm sorry? You Go lost back. me again? We Go lost your voice for a moment, but uh, now it is okay. So just like a half of a sentence. So yeah. okay, okay. So did you guys? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's flippy again. Just let me know. I'll do that refresh trick. Okay, so this was me rep showing how to do a checkbox. Again, you just use the input response, but you prompt with a in this case yes or no, and I make one the default. So I'll say yes. Yeah, smog is awesome. What's the best astrobotany plant? course, if you're playing that game. So this would be how to do a radio button. It's the same thing. We're just going to prompt for more than one option. So my back end code has a list of options, and it's just formatting them like this for the user. So I can say, oh, it's Moss. And so it'll save that. And uh, and then you'd submit your answers, right? Boom, boom, you hit that button. And then so that does a submit link here, at which point all the data is stored on the server. So I can choose how I want to process it, right? So uh, that's that's a programming technique you can leverage in Gemini. So I showed you how to do graphs and charts and stuff like that using SymPy, how to do forms uh, by embedding session information in the link. And I think a particularly involved version of that is a hangman game I made here. So if you watch what's happening on the right here in, this, in our simple program format, we're going to make a new game. So I hit new game. This runs the new game, or new game page, right? So we're on hangman CLJ question mark new game. So that's my query. All right, so over here, we get the contents, the Gemini-powered hangman game, yeah? So pick a letter, guys. This word has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six letters in it. 
What do you guys think? I don't know. <laughs> what? I just random see. I don't. Okay. I'm not even sure. Like. Can... Okay, C. Yeah. All right, we tried it. C is not in it. Okay, so we tried C, and we see we got the head up here on the hangman. All right, we didn't get a letter, and you'll see down here C has disappeared from my options. Right. So the options available. I'm just reducing the links I'm sending back because I'm maintaining them in a set on the in the closure code, and I'm just moving them from the allowed to the un, you know to the already chosen set. Now check out how I'm doing this over here though. Okay, what what we got here? <laughs> you when you click the C, this is localhost tilde G Johnson hangman CLJ question mark. This code and C here. Okay, and so what it's doing is it's tracking the entire game state in the URL. So if I pick another letter like E, okay, that didn't work either. And again, we're getting our game state is stored in the URL. This stateless in this case. Maybe A is in it. Okay, that worked. Okay, awesome. And it's going to keep on going. So it it's going to encode in these in these strings that I'm producing here, uh, these numeric strings. It's encoding how much of the word you found and which which letters you've already selected that have to be not shown to the user. So um, okay, G that was not good. Maybe Hmm. What could it be, guys? Got to be something. Maybe there's a Y in there. No luck. You lost. You've been hanged. The word you were searching for was unfair. Well, that was unfair, wasn't it? All right. So that's Hangman. So I, that's how I did Hangman with Gemini uh, based on a Gopher uh, Hangman version that I, I looked at. And so I wanted to replicate that kind of tech uh, using Gemini over here. But you see that's just all about passing game state encoded in URLs that you can then decode on the backside. So you can write an encoding and decoding procedure that basically stores a data structure with information that you need um, and just passing it back and forth. So that's a way, again, to do it without cookies or other state. Um, I could have done it with a database, of course, and then state associated with a session. Could have done that. Um, but I want to do this with a single file instead of requiring the extra content. So those are lots of examples of stuff you can do with uh, with Gemini, or with a server like this. And I guess the only other thing to look at is the actual closure code itself. Kind of really where Daniel started with everything. Does anybody have any questions about some of the examples I just showed or anything else they're thinking about? All right. And can you still hear me? Yeah, we can. Oh, okay, okay. Well, here's the code basically. Um, so, in terms of source lines of code, it's not that big. It's 465 lines of code, right? Pretty small server, all things considered. So, it should be e pretty easy to understand, I would hope. So, fire this thing up. The entry point is space age server. Um, this thing has a gen class so that you can run it as a jar if you were going to imports a bunch of libraries from the Java standard, or a bunch of classes from the Java standard library, just like Daniel did when writing his HTTP server. The main thing that's different here is that I'm pulling in a bunch of the security related classes, right? So instead of using um, bare sockets, like plain text sockets, I use Java X net SSL to get SSL sessions, context, server sockets, client sockets, SSL parameters, key manager, factories, trust managers, and so on. So I need all those things to implement the handshake. Um, this is also for accessing a key store, uh, which is the, the file that you produce on disk with the key tool command first. That's the database of your certificates that you can serve. So you have to access that with this, this namespace. And then a class that just represents the actual certificates themselves. So you can access their fields. Um, nothing special from Clojure here. I'm, I'm literally using Clojure Java IO and Clojure String. That's nothing complicated. And then it's just referencing a couple of my other namespaces for logging and request handling and line types. Uh, model is pretty simple. There's a main method here that maintains a single global server thread. Uh, that's there. And uh, we print out the program banner. And 
<laughs> verify uh, that all the inputs are good to go, that the document root exists, that the port can be bound to, and so on and so forth. And if everything is good, it just calls the start server function above. So we go up to our server just sets itself up in this little loop here. As long as the server is not already running, it just spawns a future thread. And in the future thread, uh, it's just going to step in and launch my accept connections function. And this is going to simply start handing off to um, Java pretty quick. So server came up. It launched a future thread. That way, if I run the start server from my REPL, I still have my REPL. And I can access and manipulate everything, call stop server, and so on, because the application itself is running in a child thread. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, when you go to accept connections, I think this is similar to what you did, Daniel. So we're using this accept function here, or accept method, I should say. Uh, the difference is it's just implemented over the SSL server socket, but the API is the same as the standard socket. So accept connections receives the server, or takes the server socket in uh, that we're going to be operating on and calls accept on it. Uh, accept is blocking, so my future thread blocks and sits waiting, listening on the port for somebody to talk to me with a Gemini client. Whenever you get a request, accept unblocks and returns a socket handle in another future thread so that the main thread, the, the listening thread, can just circle back and go back to listening. So we're in a little while loop here. So we spawn the future, and we immediately return into the while. In the event an exception is thrown, there's a bunch of try catches wrapping everything uh, to catch different types of socket exceptions that could occur, or exceptions in the script or the rendering of the request. Any of those, just go right back up. Uh, you'll drop the request, and you'll go back to listening for the next request. So we have this one main listening thread, and it handles the requests on child threads, just like any web server would. Requests are handled by this triplet here, running through thread last. So we call read socket on the socket. Uh, and so that little function is just here. So read socket uh, sees the socket and the document root, the, the folder I'm trying to serve from. And so what that one actually has to do is, is use these couple of little functions that are related to uh, certificates. So the session function you pull off the socket, that allows you to access the certificate. Uh, and then you just use read line on the socket to read the request. Since the Gemini request is one line only, it's just a single URL, all I need is a single read line call. With HTTP, you have to pull more requests until you get the blank line and the double uh, backslash r backslash ends, but Gemini requests are simpler. I grab the line, I pass it to a parse URI function, uh, which converts the request, uh, or converts the URI into the closure map, which is the request I'm going to pass to my script later. In that request, I go ahead and add a couple of extra pieces of information, the document root folder that I need to be serving from, uh, and then the client certificate. So I have a get client certificate function that takes the session and unpacks that. Those are implemented just above. So get client certificate in these various functions from the SSL section and the SSL session and X509 certificate classes. And this just does, does the job of extracting out the certificates from the session. Uh, it then grabs the first certificate in the certificate chain, pulls out uh, several important fields from it, and then um, and then just destructures them essentially into this map uh, that we're going to produce type, version, serial number, etc. So this is this is the map that I'll be able to provide later to my my closure scripts in their main function, so they can get various information from the user in the certificate. But uh, most of this effort was really just spending a lot of time waiting through the Java docs uh, in, in these gnarly classes <laughs> to learn all the different fields and uh, functions or methods that I would need to use to extract information out of them. Did you say it was uh, troublesome to, to find information? Uh, well, you know, Java docs are Java docs. They can be kind of a pain sometimes. The I think the challenge for some of this is just that in order to I felt like it was difficult to get a, a good sense of how the whole encryption mechanism worked for SSL in Java from the Java docs, because each one, or each Java doc page would sort of explain one tiny piece of the bigger puzzle. And you could follow it back up the class hierarchy, but just doing, doing a depth first traversal of the class hierarchy would not help you understand all the parts because some were kind of all over the place 
and not directly related to each other in the same class hierarchy. So you had to go learn about key stores here and trust store managers over here and SSL certificate like here, sessions over here, contexts over here. So it was a little disorganized. I had to rely on a lot of uh, just digging around in the Java docs and then reading a bunch of uh, web pages and blog posts of example code and then uh, running to dead ends with that until eventually I kind of reconstructed how it was supposed to work. And then I was able to, to implement it correctly here in this space. That's very interesting um, because there are some resources um, for Neo, which are uh, like how to write a concurrent code in the new, new uh, uh, Java IO APIs. Uh -huh. uh, there are books like uh, uh, good books uh, on the topic. Uh -huh. But uh, because I completely relate to what you're saying, that uh, Java Docs will you leave you hanging, um, uh -huh. because what you want is the whole picture, and Java Docs just doesn't give you the whole picture. Exactly. Um, but uh, I'm I'm really curious now because if you use SSL sockets, uh, what is ha what is um, uh, how does that um, correlate with the new J Java APIs uh, around new new I/O. If you uh -huh. know, I mean, maybe I don't want to put you on the spot, but the there is this extensive uh, efforts to build a, a modern uh, API for uh, socket programming, and by modern uh -huh. I mean that supports the underlying uh, the underlying features of operating systems. Uh -huh. Which, uh, for example, ready, readiness selections in threads and stuff like that, which is uh -huh. allows you to have this highly concurrent, highly performant web servers. And uh, in in Java Neo or Neo IO, the namespaces there you have it's broken down into channels, selectors, and buffers. And okay. I see, I see you can do this with just the SSL socket. So that's very interesting to me because I'm I'm wondering now. Like what, how to make a, a highly performant and, and, and concurrent uh, uh, modern uh, uh, server uh, uh -huh. with SSL, SSL sockets? Uh, uh -huh. How that relate to how? In other words, how would the the namespace uh, uh, it's security right? Security dot what is it? Can you show me the namespace? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So here they are. They're Java X dot net dot SSL and yeah. Java dot security. So now I'm really curious for me, like how does the namespace of Java X uh, net.ssl uh, uh, correspond or, or interact with uh, Neo? Because I suppose they are on a different abstraction level. And, you, uh -huh. and I'm really curious now about the, 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 yeah, the, the, um, the characteristics of uh, 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 the, the, the underlying uh, sockets here. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, but do you know anything about that? Um, I can say that all of this, of course, was um, with the existing JVM. <laughs> yeah, by and large, the socket API is the same for SSL sockets and plain text sockets until you include the, the actual SSL context piece. That's it's this thing here that you have to add to the sockets. But everything else is sort of polymor polymorphically implemented over it, like the accept function that you already saw that you would use to listen to a socket. This just listens to an encrypted socket, right? Or the um, the functions I use for reading and writing right here. So when you get an IO reader, you can get it over a, a, a socket or an SSL socket. It doesn't really matter. Um, that's easy to interface with. It's this session that you pull off the socket that's unique to the SSL sockets. So they have these extra methods in that class. And so using those, you can get the session object and you can then use the session object like I did here and get client certificate. Or, pulling out the certificate information. It has more than just the cert in there, um, but that's all I needed for the purpose of Gemini. So that, that lets you get it. All the pieces related to the encryption and the handshake around the current request is available in that SSL session object. It's just a little bit difficult to it, navigate its API. So I, I suppose it's uh, the, yeah, the, what you said before, it's uh, every client, uh, 
every connection is uh, is running in, in its own thread because right. the the reading and the writing takes up the thread. While the new the Java Neo, what it allows you to do is to uh, multiplex uh, connections in in the same uh-huh. thread. So I suppose okay. I suppose the next challenge would be <laughs> how to multiplex SSL connections. <laughs> but I, don't yeah, know. I guess so. I, I guess so. You'd have to figure that out. Um, but that's certainly a worthwhile and interesting exercise. It seems like the main value coming from that would be performance, right, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only performance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's probably not uh, not worth the the effort. It's just a nerdy, nerdy, geeky kind of uh, concern. Fair enough. Very unlikely to get enough simultaneous hits on my Gemini server to have to worry about it. But good to keep in the back of my mind if it ever happens. <laughs> right. Exactly. That that would be that would be uh, something. Yeah. Hmm. How many other like tricks that I that are tricky things in the code that kind of hung me up at first when I was trying to implement the protocol uh, was that was related to sending the right TLS flags inside the, the connections uh, for, for the encrypted uh, communication. So when you go to read the socket, as I said, it's not too hard. You just put an IR reader on it, line, and you're done because Gemini requests are just one URL. I build my map and I'm off to the races. So my parse URI function, you know, in my little requests namespace, all, this does all the work of taking that Gemini URI like this and turning it into a map like this with URI, scheme, host, port, etc. That's fine. Here I'm using just good old fashioned java.net.uri, parse the, the, the URI, and then start tearing it apart into its various pieces, uh, applying the appropriate uh, URL encoding or not as needed. Uh, and then I have a little very simple validation function down here. So that's what's happening in there. The, so that, while that's not hard, as I said, it's it's when you go into the go in here, you pull the client cert information out, and then I add the client cert as a submap on my parse URI. So I have your request plus the client certificate. I'm ready to give it to my closure function. The closure function will execute and send a response map. Done, right? And and now I have everything that I need to do authenticated uh, or public requests on the site. What was funky was that after you read the socket in the server. Um, now I have, now my request has been processed. I have a map, and I hand it to my Gemini handler. My the Gemini handler function that I wrote, which is my handler, it's over here in this handler namespace. I'll go back to that in a second, but it goes to that function. That one takes the request map, returns the response map, done. And then here, I then have to take that response map and turn it back into my response. So in my write socket function, I do that here. This is where it was a little bit weird. Um, so I have the socket that I'm still holding open with the client because it's a synchronous connection. And I have this map that just came back from my, my function, which has status, meta, and body in it for my Gemini response. Oops. And Uh, I think we are missing your voice for a moment again. Oh, like two, three sentences, still missing your voice. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, we're missing your voice too. No, no, uh, this is me. I forgot to unmute. 10 seconds back. Uh, and back. Mysterious every time. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Ugh. Oh, maybe uh, it is a good moment to stop for a moment and think. <laughs> that is. So wonderful, just, you know, learning from this code, it's so enlightening. And I, personally, I will need to leave in a moment. And maybe one thing we could do is, if anybody wishes to keep going, then I can uh, pass the hosting to another person here and then keep it recording. And then we can just cut the recording whenever you find it right. And uh, would that be good if you feel like staying and keeping this conversation? Yeah, sure. I can stay longer. Yeah, so maybe Daniel, I make you the host, and then you can, you know, stop recording, start recording, uh, mute out uh, other people, and so on. And and I'll say goodbye in a few moments. And much appreciate sure. you to such a beautiful discussion. And I'll email you afterwards, and we think what we do with the recording and so on. And this, sorry, right. didn't want to interrupt. So wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Thank Chuck. you for hosting us. Thank you, Daniel. Absolutely.
It was Thank great you. to be here with you guys. Shall I continue speaking or do I need yeah, to wait but, until it passes the host? I think you, oh, I am the host now. Okay. Um, you, okay. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I'm curious to see what you're going to explain about the, the, the funky thing that you had. Okay, yeah, you. sure. So here's the funky thing that doesn't show up, I think, in regular sockets. The idea was, um, <clears throat> okay, so I've received my request on my encrypted socket. I read the, the URI and I parsed it into my map. Great. I used the SSL session that's on these encrypted sockets to get at the certificate that I needed, parse it into a map, put those together so I have my request map for Gemini. I passed it to a handler function, which returns a response map. The response map comes to this right socket function. Okay. Yeah. So here I am. I got my socket. I got my response. And so the response for the Gemini responses are in two parts. There's the first line, which they all have a single line, which is a status code followed by the meta, meta string. And then there's the body, which you get only for the uh, status 20 responses, the, the ones that are sending back content, not like redirects or input requests or certificate requests or something. So I send it as two parts. The first, I get a writer on the socket. I call dot write, send the first line, which is the status, space, meta, backslash r, backslash m, as the protocol dictates. I flush the socket. So this ensures this is over the wire and we're, we're off to the races. And if there's a body, which you only have for the status 20 responses, then I had to do this, this thing here. So <clears throat> I set it up so that I can, of course, stream bytes so if you're sending an image or whatever else, because you could be sending an image or a PDF or a movie or anything or gem text. So I have to get the bytes uh, of the content. So I have to check and see if it's a string, convert this, the body to, to a byte stream, and otherwise I just get the body as bytes. Take an input stream on the bytes, and then inside there, we, we also open an output stream, and then we use the transfer to function to just pipe the bytes from the input stream to the output stream. So those funnel out to my user on the socket. And then you flush the output stream to get everything through. This is fine. This is not that complicated. This is it'll be pretty standard stuff. This was the weird thing. The shutdown output on the socket. So you have a you have these methods shutdown input and shutdown output that you can call on sockets in Java. And it turns out that calling dot shutdown output on a on an SSL socket has the unique feature of sending a TLS notify uh, command to the remote, to the peer, to, to, so to the client that you're talking to in this case. So that's, that's, and that's wholly undocumented. It's not in the Java docs, it's not anywhere. I had to figure it out by interest, like by inspecting the request to figure it out. So the reason this was important is because the, uh, the Gemini protocol dictates how you have to close the TLS connection. Uh, so, so it is, in fact, truly broken at the end, and the browser knows that you're not streaming any more content uh, to them. And you know they might just be waiting for the next thing. So you've got to say, I'm done. And the way you have to do that in TLS, in, on an, in encrypted communication, is you have to send a TLS notify signal in that protocol to the, to the other end of the socket. And so then browser when, when a browser receives that TLS notify, it's supposed to close the socket from its side, and then, and then we're good. That will break the connection. If you don't send it, you get a browser error on every request because the content comes back and then the thing, the browser will complain that it doesn't have the TLS notify. Uh, so that took me way too much time to figure out because it's not in the Java docs anywhere. I couldn't figure out. I just had to just test the API piece by piece by piece until I was able to get the signal to come through. So shutdown output returns TLS notify. Now we know. And that's the only way to, to, to validly close a TLS connection. Yeah, that's fascinating. And typical also of sockets programming. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A little, a little annoying. Um, yeah. Right. It's, it's not good enough to just close the socket, right? Because since I'm I'm in here, I get my right socket. When you come back, socket is passed to this, right, as an argument. Yeah. That, that the socket was created here. Yeah. And so as soon as we've written at this point, we go through to a finally, which calls dot close on the socket. So the socket is closed. But if you didn't yeah. call shutdown output first, you still get the error on the browser because the TLS notify signal was never sent. 
So that's why it was necessary to happen in the right socket step. So first you send the shut down uh, and then the close, right? Then the close, exactly. This happens in right socket. And then after right socket's over, in my finally clause, I close the socket. But uh, closing is insufficient to actually do it correctly for an encrypted SSL socket in Java. So now you know. And by the, by the way, the transfer to uh, method mm -hmm. is, uh, is, this is, for example, an example of a highly optimized um, API call in Java, which, mm -hmm. I mean, don't, the developer might not need to know this, but it's like actually using a feature called direct copy inside uh, in the operating system to mm -hmm. uh, to have a performant um, uh, copying and, and avoiding unnecessary um, Back and forth between the process and the kernel and the and the, mm. and the device. So it's like transfer to is direct copy. It bypasses one of those steps and it's it's very performant. But that, that's again, this is stuff you know only if you uh, if you if I mean if you have better to do. I mean, it's like <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I hear. I tried a few other things and they were a little clunky. So the transfer to was documented as being extremely efficient, which is why I ended up going with it in the end. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, the server code is just not, this is the biggest amount of code in the code base. This is probably half of the entire Space Age server. It's just this server namespace, um, really just because it has you know, some input validation that's being done and type conversions, the start and stop server function. So I can use them for my REPL. And then it's just a bunch of sort of wrapper code around Atoms holding the futures so that I can future cancel them and so on and so forth. Um, but the bulk of the, of the logic really is just in this accept connections right here, like we said. It just blocks the thread, the future thread, waiting for the connection. As soon as it gets the socket, read socket converts the, the request into a closure map. The closure map goes to Gemini handler, which returns a new closure map. Right socket converts a closure map back to the response type or the, the Gemini response and sends it back to the, the client, calls TLS notify, and closes the socket uh, to, to complete the whole thing. And then there's just try catches everywhere, wrapping the, the different pieces of the whole puzzle. And above, we have the implementing function for read and write socket and the parsing code that extracts the client certificates. The, the other thing uh, above it that's, that's unique to SSL programming, of course, is this piece here. Uh, let me go up to the create SSL socket. There. Okay, perfect. This function. <clears throat> so to create, so I called dot accept on the SSL socket. This is where I created the SSL socket in the first place. So to make one of these things, uh, you can't just use like the socket constructor. It's it's got a different structure because you have to include that SSL context. So the approach is that you have to first create an SSL context, which gives you some flexibility to decide how the handshake is going to be authorized and so on. Mm -hmm. But it but its API is, again, pretty nuts, in my opinion. Uh, so you make the SSL context, and then given the, that context, you call get server socket factory, because Java, and then you call create server socket on the, uh, on the factory, given a port. That will finally produce the socket for you bound to that port. So it's quite a bit more uh, moving pieces than the simple uh, plain text sockets. But then when you have it, so once I have my server socket, I then also have to call set want client auth on it, which instructs a socket that you can accept client certificates, which I need for Gemini. But by default, that's off in, in Java programming. It, it won't accept client certs unless you turn it on. Right. Um, yeah. And so then this, sorry? No, I said fascinating. This is the this is the trick then. This is um, uh, set want client auth, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing that uh, makes uh, Gemini special, huh? Exactly. We activate that feature, so that so that now we can prompt the browser that it can send it, and then our Gemini clients are are designed so that they can both create certificates for you and send them, so that they can be received on this side uh, via that set want client off. Does yeah. every implementation of uh, SSL um, in the in the other programming languages do do they have the ability to Turn on the, the, the client auth or, or they must. Or, if huh? they're complete implementations of SSL, they must. But but yeah. probably in other languages, 
I would I wouldn't be surprised if in some of them it's on by default and some yeah. it's off by default. Just in yeah. Java, it's off by default, so you have to turn it on. Uh, but yes, that is a feature of SSL, so everybody would have to have it implemented uh, if they're using SSL. And then I said the other moving part there was the actual making the context, the SSL context, which in Java looks like this. So you get an instance of your SSL context, which can be TLS or SSL. And then you have to call init on it, passing in a key manager array, a trust manager array, and a secure random number, whatever, generate. So these two functions, the key manager and the trust manager array, are how you sort of are, are Java's entry point to let you configure how the authentication is going to happen. They're a little bit opaque, to be perfectly honest, but um, you can make it work. Uh, so the trust manager here is the one that, this is the step that that handles the um, <clears throat> the authentication step. So the part where you pass certificates between each other and decide if they're valid. So what you have to do is you have to, have to reify this X509 trust manager object and make an instance of it, of that, of that interface. And then inside here, you have to implement these three methods. They take so this object for this thing, and then you just give it, um, <laughs> here I'm giving them empty bodies. Uh, so they're really weird functions because the return result is ignored for these two. Um, it, it only matters if they throw an exception or not. So they're totally side effecting. The idea is the check client trusted method receives the certificates uh, from the client when they're sending those up to the browser. This function will be called, and it, it can either throw an exception or not. If you throw an exception, the certificates are rejected. If it doesn't throw an exception, they're accepted. So I do nothing, and so they're accepted. Same thing with server trusted. It goes the other way. So if, if this were in the browser, you'd implement the same thing on your side of the socket. And so in, in an actual Gemini client, they would implement Tofu here, uh, the trust on first use protocol. You'd implement in this method. But this is a server, so it, it doesn't need it. Um, and on the client side, I always accept the, the, the certificate, and I then validate it downstream in my closure function. I just give it to you to determine what you want to do with it. Yeah, that's how that's done. But you have to implement both uh, in order to actually reify this thing. So both clients and servers have to do that. That's what you do there. And then your key manager array is where you show it where where you're going to store your certificates. So when it when you have to send it to the to the browser, you have to have a key store available for the server which is a database of certificates to pull one out and give it to the, give it to the browser. And so that, this is just sort of a file. Yeah. That is uh, basically handled for you. Uh, I mean, it, it's good that you don't have to store them um, on your, by yourself, no, and, and like making it dependent we, on the database and stuff. Like that. Yeah, it's, it's a key store file. You have to produce it. And so it looks yeah. like, um, this. Right. Yeah, that's all handled quite nicely. No, by Java. Yeah, you can. Yes, if you've installed the JDK on your computer, you have a command that comes with it called Key Tool, and you can use Key Tool to create these PKCS12 files, stick certs in them, auto-generate certs, remove them, rename them, list them, etc. Yeah, so that's, that's cool for Java. You have to make one ahead of time. And then you give it to Space Age via Java properties. Yeah. Like this. That's how you do it. And it's all documented in the README. Uh, so that in my code, I, of course, check those Java properties right there. <clears throat> I get the name of the file and the password. And then I just use the methods in the key manager factory and everything to actually open the file. I'm, I'm using the Java key store classes. And that lets me access the database and pull this, the certificates out of that file. And so on. Which are the key classes? That's where, where is that? Oh, yeah, Java security. Java security, yeah. That's the key store class right there. And that's the one that lets you access the contents of those files. Um, yeah, that's pretty much how it works. And I got a key store function that does that using them. Right. Nowhere did it, do I see that you have to specify the version of TLS used. Oh, um, did I do a version? I don't think I. No, that's just what I what was it. You do have to say uh, this. So when you make the context, you have to say 
you could say TLS, you could be more specific, or you could say SSL, but that's in this SSL context option. Um, so that's independent of the key specify. Um, do I have it? Blah, 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 blast. Okay, door, you have to specify the store type. And the default store type used to be JKS, which is Java Key Store. So your file would have an extension .jks. Uh, and so that was the default produced by Key Tool and used by the J JVM. But then um, several years ago, it was switched. Uh, that was replaced with the PKCS12 format, uh, probably for greater compatibility with OpenSSL, I would imagine. And so that's the default that's produced by Key Tool now. When you create one of these key store instances, you have to give it the store type. And the store type is either JKS or PKCS12, for example, as a string. So I, I just infer it by grabbing it as the file extension of the key store file. So I grab it, I capitalize it, and pass it in. So if it's keystore.pkcs12, I'll use that reader. If it's keystore.jks, I use the other reader. So that's how I made it generic. Um, I don't. I don't know if you uh, you you were um, a little while back. You cut off. So I don't know if you answered something um, that I'm wondering about the the TLS version. The, is it version one or version two or version three? Uh, yeah. Do you know what's what's going on with that? Yeah. So what's going to happen is your so your JVM has all these. Classes like this, these JavaX Met SSL classes, right? That implement SSL slash TLS. Okay, so those are those are in your Java standard library with the particular version of Java you have, like Java 17 or Java 11 or Java 8, right? So whatever version of Java you have has in its standard library implementation for certain versions of SSL and TLS in it. And older versions will have less of those mm -hmm. protocols, right? So so obviously the things available to you are dependent upon your Java version, right? Not, not what's going on in my application code. And what's going to happen is when the when your browser sends a message to the server to make that encrypted connection, as I said, the first thing that happens is in the handshake is the browser will advertise to the server which uh, protocol versions they know. So let's say, hi, server, I know TLS 1.1 and 1.2, right? And SSL. Oh, right, 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 right. So, uh, you know, one, 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 two, one, three, something. I know TLS one, one, and I know SS in the handshake. And then they agree upon both. No, that's how it's supposed to work. I mean, that's the highest. So that's what we're going to use as TLS will win. So I'm basically like yeah. that common wait. version that they both know, but you don't have the M version because it's in your standard library. Oh, wait, although you can, uh, actually now that I think about it, uh, I didn't do it in my code here, but in this, in this session object, uh, which is the thing you, you, uh, there. That's the wrong place. That's when you get it off the thing. It's in the uh, create SSL thing, not the session, the context. Okay. So when you make the context, I do, if I recall correctly, there are some additional options you can put. Uh, and it might actually be through these kinds of functions here. It might be on the socket produced from the context. But there, there are definitely there are some functions that you can use here, some methods in in the standard library that lets you restrict which uh, which protocols you will advertise. So you can say, you can pick a subset of the ones your JVM knows. And you can say, I'm only going to do TLS 1.3. That's it. I don't like the other ones. They're not safe enough. And so that's the only thing you'll advertise in the handshake. But of course, if a browser doesn't know that one, it won't be able to make the connection. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, you got to be conservative when you decide what to restrict to. I, I did not implement a particular restriction in space age. I just let it use whatever is available in your JVM. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes the most sense. Cool. That's a good question. You have any questions, Chuck? I know you're still chilling in there. You want to type anything in? OK. Oh, yeah, sure. No problem, Chuck. If you if you want to, 
uh, here's my uh, here's my email address. Okay, I think um, I'm going to cool. stop recording. If you don't mind? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, because this is like private stuff. Um, is there oh. anybody else? No, huh? I think it's just you, me, and Chuck at this point. If Chuck's going to drop, it's the two of us. So we could stop okay. sharing that. Like, I'm going to stop recording now, and then we can continue off. Uh, off All right. Time. Thanks so much, Chuck. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.